Here is a full lecture on projectile motion. In this lecture, expect to learn everything you'll need to know about projectile motion. I'll start from the very fundamentals by explaining the key definitions you'll need to know about projectile motion. Then I'll take you through some equation derivations and finally, towards the end, I'll be going through some exam style worked examples that will help you appreciate how you can solve any projectile motion problem. Arnold Dragakuramia is my name and this is Kisembo Academy. Today we get to introduce ourselves to projectile motions. Now when you're kicking a ball from, let's say you're taking a free kick and you take it for footballers, if you're taking a ball for, like a free kick and you're kicking it to a certain destination or if you play basketball and you try to target the ball, you throw it in the air like you're trying to pass it on to your colleague or you're trying to throw it into the basketball hoop or let's say you get a stone and you throw it in the air. If you get a stone and you throw it in the air, it's going to make that kind of motion. The stone you throw will first go up and then eventually it will reach a certain point where it can't go any further up and then it will come back down. And of course as it's being thrown up and then it comes back down or if you're talking about a ball that is being kicked from the ground to go into the air, as this ball moves up and then it comes back down, it's going to create a parabolic curve. This kind of curve is what we're talking about here to be the projectile motion. Now, a projectile motion basically is a particle that is thrown at an angle to the horizontal. This is the horizontal we are talking about under the influence of gravity. Or in other words, what I'm trying to mean is that if I kick a ball up or if I throw a stone into the air and then it comes back down, it is going to create the kind of motion that I'm calling a projectile motion. And this is always influenced by gravity. In our study of projectile motions, we shall assume that the forces of air resistance are negligible. So we will not be putting them into consideration as we are doing our calculations. But only that as this object moves up and then it comes back down, it is under the influence of gravity. So this is an illustration of the projectile motion. This path in green is the is what is demonstrating the projectile motion and the path taken by the projectile motion is what we are calling a trajectory or if I may define it for those taking notes that a trajectory is simply the path followed by the projectile. Then of course as we are kicking this as this this motion is happening it is it always happens at a certain angle to the horizontal this is the horizontal we are talking about and the horizontal we are talking about has to be passing through what we call the point of projection the point of projection is where the trajectory starts from and the horizontal to the point of projection the this the angle between that horizontal and the direction where maybe a, the, the ball is going to be kicked that angle is what we are calling the angle of projection and if we are to define it the angle of projection is simply the angle between the direction of the projectile and the horizontal that is passing through the point of projection. Then of course when this motion is taking place for it to move from here up to this it's going to take some time and that time is what we are calling the time of flight. So if I may define what time of flight is it is the time taken by the projectile to move from its initial position to the final position along the projectile or along the trajectory or along the path of the projectile. So if let's say the, the ball has moved or the particle has moved up to here, it means that the time taken for it to move from its initial position up to that point is what we are calling the time of flight. And of course now as of course when it is moving upwards it is making a certain horizontal direction. Let's say this particle has moved from here up to there. It is going to it is going to make a displacement in the x direction, and that is what we are going to call we are calling it the range. If the particle is moving, and let's say we need to find how far it has moved when it is here in the x direction, or let's call it the horizontal direction. How far has it moved in the horizontal direction from this point? It means that the day we we mark off the distance from here up to there. And that, has, that is what we are calling the 
range. So in simple terms, this range or the horizontal range, if you may call it that, is the distance from the initial position of the projectile to the final position along the horizontal plane through the point of projection. If this thing has moved up to here, and we want to find the horizontal range when the thing is at that point, the ball, we simply drop a perpendicular right here and we measure off this distance. This distance is what we are calling the horizontal range. Now, of course, the horizontal range keeps on increasing as the ball progresses. When it's here, the horizontal range keeps increasing up to a point whereby we have what we call the maximum horizontal range. Of course, the maximum horizontal range is the distance along the horizontal plane through the point of projection it would travel before reaching the same vertical position as it started before. When we are talking about the vertical position, this is the vertical position. When this is moving along, it, the vertical position keeps increasing. This is along the Y. So it means that let's say the ball has been moving. There is that point there. It has moved up to there. This is what we call the vertical position. When the ball is at that point, this is the vertical position it's in. So what does that mean? It means that whenever this particle is moving up, this is, let's call this Y1, vertical position Y1. We have another vertical position Y2. So this particle position, this ball is at this vertical position Y1 when it is at this point. Then if it is to move up, then it comes down. It will be at the same vertical position on its way back. Likewise here, it is at vertical position Y2 when it's coming up. Then when it completes its journey, when it's coming back down, it will at some point be at the same vertical position when it's coming back. Now we are saying that the, the distance for, for this ball to come and be at the same vertical position, let's call this Y0, the vertical position as it was when it was beginning, the horizontal distance that is traveled for this particle to be at the same vertical position as it had started is what we call the maximum horizontal range. So if I may repeat the definition, the maximum horizontal range is simply the distance along this horizontal plane through the point of projection it would travel before reaching the same vertical position as it started from and of course when this ball also is moving up is what we call it's going to reach a certain maximum height beyond which it can no longer go up and then the gravitational forces will definitely work on it and it will start coming down that maximum height is what we are calling the greatest height in our calculations we shall also be exploring and shall be looking at how we get the greatest height of a projectile and by definition we can simply say that the greatest height is simply the distance between the highest point reached by the projectile and the horizontal plane through the point of projection now in this video we are going to look at the derivation of certain expressions in that retain that relate to projectile motions we are going to look at how the expression that we will arrive at that will help us to express the time of the time it takes for a projectile motion to reach the maximum height the time it takes for this projectile motion to reach its final position to to go through maximum range we are also going to look at how we derive the expression for maximum height we are also going to look at the expression for maximum range But before we get into those derivations, there, is, there are some fundamental truths that we need to know. That when a projectile, when a particle is moving along a projectile or along a, a trajectory, this motion that is, has been propelled up by this initial velocity u has got both the horizontal, it has got both the horizontal and the vertical components of that velocity. So wherever this particle is, when it's here at the beginning and it has been kicked out at that angle alpha to the horizontal, at that point it is having both a horizontal and a vertical component of that velocity. As it is moving along at that point, it still has horizontal and vertical components of that velocity u. 
when it is now also coming down it means that the horizontal component is no longer facing upwards but now facing downward since this thing is now coming downward but this one remains in the x direction and also right here the it's the same thing the horizontal vy is moving downwards this is in that direction and and, and that is the velocity with which this particle moves in the projectile motion when we are analyzing the motion of these particles as it is moving along the trajectory we know we shall analyze it in two dimensions we shall analyze it in the vertical direction and in the horizontal direction so we are going to now look at how we find the velocity of this but we are going to analyze the velocity in in terms of the horizontal and the vertical then we shall also look at the distance that is covered as this particle moves as this particle is moving there is the distance covered for example when you look at this particle at that point when it is at this point it has covered a certain distance in the x direction and still it has covered a certain distance in the y direction if you look at this particle at this point if I'm to analyze its distance, it has moved a certain distance in the x direction and also a certain distance in the y. So that's how we shall be looking at those distances. So let's get moving. Well, let's get started with how the velocity in the y direction is conjured. And we shall be using the first equation of motion. Now let's look at the trajectory once more. We say that when this thing is moving, it's moving in that direction, that is the velocity u that is propelling it. This velocity by which it is moving can be resolved in the x direction and also in the y direction. The x direction and the y direction. And right there we are having is the angle alpha. So if I may draw a vector diagram for this here, we know that this thing is moving in the x direction like this. When this velocity vx is moving in that direction, then from there we have vy moving in that direction. This is vy. The resultant of vx and vy is what was giving us u, the velocity u. So the velocity u is a resultant of the velocity x in the x direction and the y component or in the vertical direction. And here right here is our angle alpha. So it means that if I'm to express u in terms of vx, vx is the same as saying vx is going to be u times the cosine of alpha. I have resolved u in the x direction. If I'm to resolve u in the y direction, vy would be equal to u sine alpha now of course i have mentioned this this is on the assumption that you know how i have resolved these forces this uh, on, on how we resolve forces along the x and the y direction is a trigonometrical topic that i will cover in detail by just extrapolating this i am under the assumption that you know how we resolve so we'll proceed with our derivations so we want to look at the velocity in the y direction and with that being said now let's look at the vertical and horizontal velocities. Looking at the vertical and horizontal velocities of a projectile motion, of course, we are going to use V is equal to U plus AT. Now that we are using that, we shall, uh, since we are looking at the vertical and horizontal velocity, let's begin with the vertical. Of course now the vertical, it means we are looking at the Vy. So we shall say that Vy is definitely u plus 80. Now the u we are talking about here should be in the y direction. And when we look, it, we look at our resolution here, our u in terms of the y direction, it so happens to be u sine alpha. So it's going to be u sine alpha plus acceleration times time now since we are looking at the vertical direction we know that when this projectile is moving it is influenced by gravity and gravity acts in the vertical direction so it means that our value of a here is going to be gravity 
but it is in the negative direction since the thing is moving against gravity so it's minus g multiply that by t so definitely that's going to become u sine alpha minus g t that is our first expression for that is the, the vertical velocity in the y direction let's look at the velocity in the x direction now that is in the horizontal direction again in the horizontal we are still going to use v is equal to u plus at and we know that vx that is velocity in the x direction is going to be equal to u the velocity in the x direction is definitely exp this u resolved in the x direction is u cos of alpha so this is going to become u cosine of alpha then of course it's going to be plus acceleration times time now of course in the x direction there is no acceler there is no gravity remember we said that this projectile motion is moving only and only under the influence of gravity so it is gravitational force that is acting on it the acceleration due to gravity now uh, we all know that acceleration due to gravity only acts in the vertical manner in the horizontal gravity is zero so it means that this expression a times t is zero so it means that as far as our but our horizontal velocity is concerned it is expressed as v x is going to be equal to u cosine of alpha uh, plus zero because this is zero so it is going to remain like that and that is going to be our second expression so those are the expressions for the velocities that we will be using in the x and in the y so now let's go ahead and look at the expressions for vertical and horizontal distance Now, when you're talking in terms of the vertical and horizontal distance, we are talking about the vertical and horizontal displacements. For example, when this particle has moved up to that point, when it is at this point, it has experienced a certain vertical displacement, which I'll call y. Let's call it s, because distance is s in the y direction, distance in the y direction. Then also we have distance covered by that particle in the x direction. Let's call it sx. So now we're supposed to express the distance of this particle in terms of the vertical, the vertical, and the horizontal. Here we're going to use this equation, s is equal to ut plus a half at squared, the second equation of motion. And now since we are looking for the distance move, for example, let's begin with the one in the y direction, sy. We know that sy, that is distance covered, in the, the, the in the vertical direction is going to be equal to u of course we are now dealing with u in the y direction remember our u here in the y direction is this so it's going to be u times sine of alpha so it is u times sine of alpha we have exp this u is actually u sine of alpha times the time that is going to be now plus a half times acceleration. Now, since acceleration is in the y direction, it's in the vertical direction, we know that it is against gravity, so it is minus, minus g times t squared. And definitely sy is going to become u sine alpha times t this is going to become minus a half g t squared and this is our expression for vertical direction and then going ahead to find the value of sx in the horizontal direction that distance in the horizontal direction it's still we're going to use the same thing of course in the horizontal our value of u this value of u in the horizontal direction is u cos alpha. So it's going to become u times the cosine of alpha. Multiply that by time times time plus. Now, of course, in the horizontal direction, we do not have gravity. Acceleration is zero. So this whole term dies. So this is plus zero. So in the x direction, it's going to remain as u cosine of alpha times t. 
So let's look at the phenomenon of maximum height. We want to derive the expression for the time taken for the projectile particle to reach maximum height. By maximum height, this is what I'm talking about, that when a projectile or when a particle is moving along a trajectory, it's going to reach a certain point where it will attain maximum height, then it will start coming back down. Now, the condition for this to happen, we know that, of course, if we want to find maximum height in our previous expression, we've already gotten the expression for vertical distance. So it means we can we have the expression for getting this, but and also we have we can get time for the for, for for maximum height because in our expressions the ones we've been deriving before have the element of time in it. But now what happens when the thing reaches maximum height when this thing is thrown up? If the gravitational force was not pulling this ball down or this particle down, it would just continue up to infinity. But since we are having a force of gravity acting on it to come back down, it means that as this thing is moving, it's going to reach a certain point, then it's going to pause a bit, then it comes down. Now at that point where that particle is going to pause a bit before it comes down, that is the point when the maximum height is achieved. Now the point when maximum height is achieved is, is achieved when the velocity in that y direction is zero. Because remember, Whenever this particle is moving in that direction, we are having Vy and we have Vx. In simple terms, we are having the velocity acting on this particle acting in the y direction and in the x direction. So it means that by the time it is moving, by the time it reaches that point of maximum height, it means the Vy is zero. Of course, Vx is still active. Vx is still moving, making this particle move in that direction. But Vy at that point is zero. That's why from this point when it starts coming down here, this Vy changes direction now. It becomes negative. It moves in the negative direction, but Vx is still in that direction as the thing moves. So at that point, that is the fact we shall extrapolate and say that at that point, Vy is zero at the point of maximum height. And so when we say, since we know that at that point Vy is equal to zero at maximum height, then we are able to get the expression for the time taken for this object to move from the point of projection to the maximum height. So we shall say. And when I say that at maximum height, the value of Vy is equal to zero, this is what I'm talking about, this expression that we took came across. So this expression, this Vy is equal to zero, the vertical velocity. So since Vy is equal to zero, from this Vy is going to be equal to u sine alpha minus gt. This value of Vy is zero at maximum height. So it means it is zero is going to be equal to u sine alpha minus gt. So we transfer this thing, it comes this side. This becomes gt is going to be equal to u sine alpha. Since uh, we are looking for time taken for maximum height, we make t the subject of the formula. Our value of t now therefore becomes... So this becomes our expression for maximum height. Now that we know the time taken for this particle to move from here up to its maximum height, what is the maximum height, the expression for maximum height? Can we still get it? We have the time. So we can use our second equation of motion to find the expression for our maximum height, which we, which we have called capital H. Since this value of H is in the vertical direction, it is in Y. So we already got our expression for vertical directions, Y. We say that vertical, the vertical distance is given by that expression. So this is what we are going to try to use to find our maximum height. Let me, so SY is equal to that. Sy, which is our maximum height, capital H, is going to be equal to u sine alpha. So this is going to become u sine alpha times t. Now, this time is definitely time taken to reach the maximum height, capital H. And in our previous working, we got the expression for maximum height to be equal to that. So definitely, we are going to, for the value of t, we are going to substitute for this. So it means it's going to be u sine alpha times time. The value of time here is u sine alpha, divide that by g, 
this is the time taken to reach maximum height minus a half times the gravity times t which is u sine alpha divide that by g that is squared so this becomes u squared times sine times sine is going to be sine squared alpha divide that by g minus this g cancels with one of the g's here so this becomes a half into u squared sine squared alpha over g and of course if you have to look at these expressions you look at this one and that one are the same so it's like one x minus a half x definitely this means that our expression for maximum height capital h is going to be equal to a half So this is the expression for the maximum height, capital H. That's how we arrive at it. So moving on to our next derivation, we know that when a projectile motion is moving like that, there is when a type particle is here, then it moves up to there, then it moves up to there, and so on. So when it is here, it means that it's vertical displacement is at zero level at, along this. When it moves from here to come to this level, this will be its vertical displacement. Call it y, y1. When it moves from here to come to here, its new vertical bless, displacement, we could call it y2. Now, what I want to bring to your attention is that when this particle is at this point, its vertical displacement is y1, but as it moves up, it is going to come back and it will be at the same vertical displacement on its way back. Likewise here, it is on this, its vertical displacement on its way up, when it comes back down, it is on the same vertical displacement on its way down. So it means that even when this particle is at this point, here, as it's moving, its vertical displacement is zero. When it moves up, it will still come back to vertical displacement zero when it is finishing. So now the mere fact that it, the vertical displacement here of a particle along a projectile happens twice on its way up and on its way down, we are going to take advantage of that fact to help us to find the time taken for this particle to move from here up to there. Now we are trying to derive the expression for the time taken for this particle to move from this point up to that point and the fact we are going to use here is that when this particle is at when the vertical displacement of this particle here is zero the particle is either here or it is there so we are going to get the expression for the time taken for the thing to move the expression for vertical displacement we already got it right here so we shall say that sy is going to be equal to u sine alpha t minus a half g t squared. This is the expression for the vertical displacement here. This is what we're calling sy. Now, when sy is zero, it means that this particle is either at that point or at that point. So when this expression is zero, either this thing is here or it is right there. And when we make this thing zero, it means that we're able to make t the subject of the formula and we are able to get the time of flight or the time taken for this thing to move from here up to there which we are calling the time of flight. So we will start with our working. Like I had already said, we said that at the end of this flight the vertical displacement will be zero. So looking at this expression of sy is equal to u sine alpha t, when this thing is zero, when sy is equal to zero, it means that this is going to become zero is going to be equal to u sine alpha times t minus a half g t squared we want to get the expression for the time taken 
for this whole thing to for the time of flight so since it is zero so it means that we can as well get this thing bring it that way so this becomes a half g t squared is going to be equal to this expression which is u sine alpha t of course here uh, this t uh, this t will cancel with one of those t's we remain with a half g is going to be equal to u sine alpha so when we make t the subject of the formula here we shall end up with the time of flight is going to be equal to 2u sine alpha over g now if you to look at this expression for time of flight that is the time taken by the projectile to move from this point up to that point and you compare this time of flight with the time taken for the thing to reach maximum height you realize that the time taken for the projectile to mix to meet maximum height is that the time taken for the projectile to go full range or to finish the flight is twice u sine alpha if i'm to recover this to you you will notice that this expression is the same as that expression and so the time of flight the time taken for the the whole thing to move from beginning to end is twice the time taken to reach maximum height this is the time taken to reach maximum height and the time of flight is twice the time taken to reach maximum height what does that mean it means that for the the time taken to move from here up to there is the same as the time taken to move from here up to there this means that this trajectory is symmetrical and now finally we can go ahead and find the maximum horizontal range the maximum horizontal range so happens to be the horizontal distance covered for the thing to move from here up to there now from our derivations earlier the expression for maximum horizontal range is given by this expression sx this is the distance covered for maximum horizontal range the, or any distance covered along the x direction let's say this thing has moved and it stopped here this is what we are calling sx from here up to there that is sx it is given by u cos alpha t we derived this at the beginning of the video so meaning that if i want to find the time taken or the distance sx the distance covered to move from here up to the end it means that i'm going to get this expression and multiply this by the time taken to move from here up to there now the time taken to move from here up to there is the, uh, the, the, the time of flight that we've just ar arrived at just previously. So we'll simply come and plug it in here and get our expression for maximum horizontal range. So to get our maximum horizontal range, we know that for horizontal range, the distance moved in the x direction, sx, is going to be equal to, s subscript x, is going to be equal to u cosine of alpha times time we know that this is going to become u cosine of alpha let's call the maximum horizontal range let's copy call it capital r capital r is going to be u cos alpha times time now what's the time taken the time of flight the time taken for this thing to move from here up to there that's the time of flight and it's the time taken to make the maximum horizontal range and it is the time we're going to use to substitute right there and the time of flight we got was t is equal to u g to u sine alpha t this is the time of flight we got so this is what we're going to substitute there so right here the value of t the time of flight is this multiply that by 2u sine alpha divide that by g so definitely our range here is going to become when we open the brackets here it's going to become 2u squared sine alpha cosine of alpha divided that by g this is already the expression maybe to apply some trigonometrical identities here we know that from trigonometry 2 sine alpha cos alpha will give you sine 2 alpha now from trigonometrical identities we know that 2 sine theta cos theta is going to be equal to 2 
is equal to sine 2 theta. Now if you look at this expression and compare it to our expression right here, you realize that it is we have here 2, then sine theta, in this case it is sine alpha cos alpha. So meaning that if you are to isolate this out, this remaining thing 2 sine alpha cos alpha is the same as sine 2 theta. So it means that our maximum range can be expressed in terms of the u squared of course remains, it becomes u squared, then the remaining expression is in fact sine 2 alpha divided by g and that is our expression for range. So if I may make a recap, we are able to find the vertical and the horizontal velocities of a projectile expressing them in terms of x and y. We went ahead and from there we went ahead and find the vertical and horizontal distances of a projectile which we called S subscript Y and S subscript X and we used that information to help us derive all the remaining expressions and some of these expressions are we were able to find the maximum horizontal range given by that expression we were able to find the time of flight that is uh, this expression we were also able to find the expression for maximum height of a projectile which is this expression and we are also to find, able to find the time taken to reach the maximum height, which is this expression. How to derive the equation of a trajectory? Now, like I had earlier said, the trajectory is simply the path that is taken by the particle that is moving in a projectile motion. Now the equation of the trajectory simply seeks to describe this parabolic motion of that projectile. And the process of deriving it involves us using the equation, two equations. Now think of this as um, we are trying to find the equation of this curve, which so happens to be the equation of this projectile. And so we are going to assume, let's say this is a particle. It has been moving from this point and let's get an arbitrary point x comma y. When it is at this point x, if we are to take this scenario as though it was a, a grid, we know we have the x and the y, y axis, the x and y axis. And so it means that the coordinates of this point at this, at this, for me to be able to locate this on the grid, it means that I have to move a certain distance in the x direction to our, then the certain distance in the y direction to locate it. That's why I've called it x comma y. So we need to derive the equation of this trajectory in terms of x and y. And x and y in this case being x is the horizontal displacement or the horizontal direction and y being the vertical displacement for us to be able to locate that point. So it means that uh, when we get the equation of this trajectory where we are able to tell the values of x and y at any point this point is along the trajectory. So, it means that we're going to use two equations. We're going to use the equation of vertical and horizontal displacement of a, of, a, of a projectile motion. These are the two equations I'm talking about. S, X, that is the displacement in the X direction. Let's call it X is going to be U cos alpha T. And then displacement in the Y direction is given by that. Now, how we come up with these two I did that before. I think, let me give a replay for how we arrive to these two. Then we'll proceed. Now, when you're talking in terms of the vertical and horizontal distance, we are talking about the vertical and horizontal displacements. For example, when this particle has moved up to that point, when it is at this point, it has experienced a certain vertical displacement, which I'll call Y. Let's call it S, because distance is S in the Y direction, distance in the Y direction. Then also we have distance covered by that particle in the X direction. Let's call it SX. So now we're supposed to express the distance of this particle in terms of the vertical, the vertical, and the horizontal. Here we're going to use this equation, S is equal to UT plus a half a t squared, the second equation of motion. And now since we are looking for the distance move, for example, let's begin with the one in the y direction, s y. We know that s 
y, that is distance covered in the, 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 in the vertical direction is going to be equal to u. Of course, we are now dealing with u in the y direction. Remember our u here in the y direction is this. So it's going to be u times sine of alpha. So it is u times sine of alpha. We have exp this u is actually u sine of alpha times the time. That is going to be now plus a half times acceleration. Now since acceleration is in the y direction, it's in the vertical direction, we know that it is against gravity. So it is minus minus g times t squared and definitely sy is going to become u sine alpha times t this is going to become minus a half g t squared and this is our expression for vertical direction and then going ahead to find the value of sx in the horizontal direction, the distance in the horizontal direction, it's still we're going to use the same thing. Of course, in the horizontal, our value of u, this value of u in the horizontal direction is u cos alpha. So it's going to become u times the cosine of alpha. Multiply that by time, times time, plus now, of course, in the horizontal direction, we do not have gravity. Acceleration is zero, so this whole term dies, so this is plus zero. So in the x direction, it's going to remain as u cosine of alpha times t. We'll come back from that replay. Now, in this case, our this is s displacement in the x direction. Let's call this x. Sy, this is displacement in the y direction. Let's call this y. So it means with these two equations, I'm going to solve them simultaneously, or I'm going to substitute one in another to get another expression. So this is y. This is y is equal to u sine alpha t, which is this, minus a half gt squared, which is that minus a half gt squared. So now what I am required of is to substitute this expression into this one. And so when we make t the subject of the formula in this first expression of x, making t the subject of the formula means that t is going to be equal to x over u cos alpha. So here I've made x, I have made t the subject of the formula, so I come and replace that value of t right there and right there into this expression then I will I will come up with the equation of the trajectory and this is exactly what we did here that this y is equal to u sine alpha times t now the value of t is the got from here we make it the subject of the formula it becomes x over u cos alpha this is minus a half g times t squared which is that expression squared so we are going to go ahead with this expression and simplify it and we shall get our answer so in this case here, y becomes u sine alpha times x, divide that by u cos alpha. This is supposed to be cos alpha, cos alpha not x, yeah. So this is u cos alpha minus a half times gravity into x squared over u squared cos squared alpha so definitely this becomes we know that this u and that u will cancel we have sine alpha over cos alpha sine alpha over cos alpha from our trigonometrical identity sine over cos is tan so it's going to become tan of alpha times this x let's put that x right there is going to be equal to uh, minus a half times g into x squared that is going to be x squared multiply that by cos squared alpha now from our trigonometrical identities we know that 1 over cos squared alpha or 1 over cos squared theta is going to be equal to sec squared theta we're going to use this to help us 
here. Here we, we are realizing that this is 1 over cos squared alpha. So this 1 over cos squared alpha becomes sec. So this becomes x squared over u squared. Multiply that by this, which so happens to be sec. So this becomes x times tangent of alpha minus this becomes gx squared over 2u sec squared alpha. So this is basically our the equation of the trajectory. Now we can go ahead and still simplify it further. We know that still this sec squared alpha can be expressed in another way. Still from our trigonometrical identities, we know that sec squared alpha is going to be equal to 1 plus tan squared alpha. Here it's alpha, so meaning that we still can express sec squared alpha in terms of this. So this can still further be simplified into y is equal to x tan alpha minus g x squared over 2u into 1 plus tan squared alpha. And that right there is the equation of the trajectory. In today's session, we are going to explore or we are going to discuss how we get the direction of motion of a particle along a trajectory at a particular time. Now, of course, I will, as this particle along its direction, as it, along its motion, as it's moving, it keeps changing its direction. And its direction is b defined by the angle. This is alpha. Alpha so happens to be the angle of projection. But as this particle keeps moving, this alpha keeps changing. It means that the angle here is not the same as the angle here. And the angle right there, that is the angle between the horizontal and the direction where this thing is moving, it keeps changing. So now, if we want to know this angle at a particular time t along this projectile, that is what we mean by direction of motion. We get this direction of motion by analyzing the direction of the velocity of a particle at a particular time t. Now, analyzing the direction of the velocity, for example, let's look at this point. We have this is velocity in the x direction. Here we have velocity in the y direction. And for us to be able to get that angle theta means that we're supposed to analyze the velocity of this particle at that time when it is right here. So if I may draw a vector diagram of this, this is Vx moving in that direction. Then we have Vy moving in this direction. Then we have that, um, that velocity in that direction from V to X. Let me call this V. So meaning that if I want to find the direction or the, the, the position or the direction of motion here, it means that I want to find this angle. By what angle is this thing or is this particle at that point? At what angle is it traveling? The angle to the horizontal. So it is as simple as finding that. And me finding that means that I am going to use trigonometry. So in this case here, I can use tangent of this angle theta. We know that here, tangent of that angle theta is going to be equal to the opposite, which is Vy, over the adjacent, which is Vx. And getting the angle here of Vy over Vx, I'm able to get the value of angle theta and that theta so happens to be the direction of that particle at that point. We discussed this earlier when we said and for us to get this value of theta we know that our value of vy we, is, the, is this one and our value of vx is right there. So we substitute these expressions right here to be able to get our value of theta. Now, if our value of theta is zero, it means that the particle is at maximum. Because it is at maximum when this theta is zero, it keeps on reducing up to the maximum point when the value of theta is zero. And if our value of theta so happens to be a negative, it simply means that 
the particle is moving back downwards and so the value of theta in this case is below the horizontal when it's below the horizontal it's a negative value when the value of theta is above the horizontal it's a positive value we shall be using this as we are doing our worked examples in the sessions coming ahead hello everyone thanks for tuning in my name is Arnold and this is Kisembo Academy in today's session we are basically going to we are going to be deriving some formula standard formula for projectile motion this standard formula that we are going to derive for projectile motion is the mo the formula for the maximum height a projectile can ever reach the formula for the range of a projectile that is the horizontal range then the formula for the time of flight for projectile motion. We are going to derive those and we are going to derive those while just playing around with these three common equations of motion. Now after deriving this formula it's going to be important that you have this formula at your fingertips. In some jurisdictions some people are allowed to have separate booklets, formula booklets while they're doing their exams. In some examining bodies they are not allowed to do so and so you're supposed to kind of cram but before you cram them it's important that you're able to understand where these formulas come from how these formulas are derived whereas we are going to derive this formula for time of flight for maximum height and the horizontal range of a projectile motion when it comes to numbers it's not always going to be the case that you will have to use these formulas to solve questions sometimes you're going to have to to apply these three equations of motion to reason out numbers and be able to calculate numbers without necessarily using the formulas we are going to derive in this session. So that is why it's important that you're able to understand how these standard formulas for time of flight, for maximum range and maximum height of a projectile use, it's important that you understand how they are derived because the reasoning behind how they are derived is going to be the reasoning you're going to be using in trying to do some worked examples or in trying to do some numbers. We shall be doing some numbers in the upcoming session. So let's get into the video today and let's start deriving. So in the derivations we are going to do, we are just going to basically play around with these three equations of motion and it's quite easy. So let's first get a diagrammatic representation of a projectile motion. Like we all know, when a projectile is in motion, let's say this is uh, the ground level, ground zero, let me call it ground zero. When a projectile is moving, it moves up like that and then eventually it comes down there, like that. So as that motion is happening, this is the particle, it could be a ball or something. This point where it is beginning from is what we are calling the point of projection. Now at that point of projection, a projectile is always, it always takes off with an initial velocity, which we are always going to denote u. As it's taking off with that initial velocity along the road here, along its journey here, its velocity keeps changing direction and the velocity that keeps changing direction here as it's moving along its journey here is what we're denoting as v v v the final velocity this when it's beginning it's the initial velocity u so as it's moving along that's the final velocity we all know that the distance it covers this horizontal distance that is going through the point of projection up to here this is what we're calling the uh, the horizontal range and this is the maximum height it achieves while it's moving so there are certain characteristics that we need to know in relation to these three equations of motion that normally happen as this projectile is moving this particle one characteristic you need to know about this motion is that when it's reaching its maximum height its velocity is zero so if it reaches maximum height and its velocity is zero because it has paused momentarily before it comes back down to this ground zero level what how can we use that information to try and derive a standard formula using this 
if we use the third equation of motion here which is this one and we say that when the final velocity is zero what becomes of this what how can we use this to end up with you know an expression a standard formula so let's get started with that one so in a projectile a projectile is at maximum height its final velocity is zero so let's get to the three the third equation of motion v squared is equal to u squared plus 2as so we shall go ahead and say that our v squared is equal to u squared plus 2as that is the third equation of motion and we are saying that uh, at maximum height this value of v is equal to zero so when this value of v becomes zero at maximum height in the context of that projectile motion what becomes of the rest of this so let's proceed so this is going to be zero is going to be equal to the initial velocity now take note that uh, one thing you need to know is that here uh, when this thing is taking off from here it is taking off upwards right to um, perpendicular to the ground like okay this initial velocity it is going off at a certain angle to the horizontal as it's going up so the convention here is that everything that is going up is positive and of course uh, in this case it means that if this velocity is moving upwards it means that this is positive velocity remember velocity is a vector quantity so upwards is positive and definitely if we ever get to deal with a projectile motion where this is moving downwards like that it would mean that at that point the velocity is moving downwards but we shall come to that in, in a later session so when it's moving up that is upwards it's a positive velocity it means also that even the displacement this is like ground zero so if the displacement is in that direction it is positive displacement and if the displacement is in the opposite direction it means that is negative displacement and when we are talking about displacement we are talking about in reference to this ground zero the ground where the point of projection is that platform so since this is an upward motion we are supposed to resolve this initial velocity in the vertical direction because this is motion going upwards so it, so we resolve this in the vertical direction and since this is going off at an angle theta if i may extrapolate this triangle here like this and redraw it here roughly this is our initial velocity that's our angle theta and we are supposed to resolve this velocity in the vertical direction in this direction where in this which is that you know as it's moving up so you'll find that this resolving this is going to end up it's going to be u sine of theta that is the component of the initial velocity in that in that direction so meaning that right here our initial velocity here that's how it's going to be represented we're going to say it is u squared sine squared theta like that then that is going to be now it's going to be plus two times a what's the acceleration now remember this is the ground the acceleration due to gravity always acts downwards but this particle is moving upwards so if this particle is moving upwards it means it is moving against gravity because it is moving against gravity it means that our acceleration here due to gravity is going to be a negative value it can't be a positive value why because the particle is moving against gravity so it means it's going to be two times our gra our acceleration due to gravity is negative g times s now remember the s is displacement yeah and remember here still we said that displacement will be positive when you're moving upwards it will be negative when you're moving downwards at when velocity is zero or when the particle momentarily pauses when velocity is zero we have attained maximum height so in other words the displacement here the value of s remember we're counting this value of s the displacement from ground zero so the displacement here when the particle momentarily pauses that is when the velocity is zero that displacement s 
is actually the maximum height. So it means that in this case, this value of S becomes our capital H, like that. So after getting that expression, let's ease it up a bit. It means that here 0 is going to be U squared sine squared theta. Uh, this can become minus 2 G H. So from this, we can actually go ahead and get our expression for maximum height. Our expression for maximum height by making H the subject of the formula. Let's take this thing. That oh, Let's get this thing here. Let's take it that way. So this becomes 2 G capital H is going to be equal to U squared sine squared theta. When we divide both sides here by 2 G, by 2 G, this is what we end up with. This goes with that. You remain with capital H as U squared sine squared theta. Divide that by 2G. Now, this is the expression for maximum height of a projectile motion. The maximum height of a trajectory from the ground zero. So, that is how we derive this. In one of our previous sessions, I was able to derive this same expression, but I used a different approach. This is just another way of approaching it. What I would like to bring to your attention here is the reasoning behind how we play around with these equations of motion to arrive at these expressions. So in this case, we use the third equation of motion and we are able to get to this. So let's get on to the next. Let's get back to our diagram. So one of the characteristics of this trajectory is that when it reaches at uh, uh, around here it momentarily pauses and when it momentarily pauses its maximum velocity is zero so we've used that characteristic of its maximum velocity being zero we plugged it in here and we were able to come up with this kind of expression now somebody might ask me why did we choose the third equation of motion why didn't we put in this this you know why didn't we say why didn't we use the first equation of motion okay let's use also that in the first equation of motion let's plug in that characteristic and let's see where it takes us so let's say this is v is equal to u plus a t that's the first equation of motion and now we are saying that using that uh, when the maximum when we reach maximum height the velocity is zero right so when at maximum height velocity is zero is going to be equal. that is u sine theta that is that and of course that's going to be plus gravity which is negative g times time now uh, this time definitely because we said maximum velocity at, 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 at I mean since we said that right here uh, the velocity is zero when it is about to turn back down the velocity is momentarily zero it means that since we say the velocity is equal to zero it means that this value of t the time is going to correspond to when the velocity is is you know the time taken to move from here to there so the, in other words this value of time t is representing the time taken to reach this condition it is the time taken to reach maximum height so it's going to be this times capital t, uh, let's call it t t prime and let's say that this t prime is the time taken to reach maximum height because it's at maximum height that the velocity is zero so this is going to become um, the expression will end up being u times sine of theta minus g times t prime let's get this expression let's take it that way so this is going to become g t prime is going to be equal to u times the sine of theta when we divide both sides by g we end up with our expression of t prime giving us u sine theta over g and so this right here is the expression for this is time taken to reach maximum height so I think you can see this is the time taken to use to reach the maximum height and this was the maximum height reached 
I am doing this recap because some people just really cram how to derive these expressions. And it's not good to cram. Just understand the reasoning behind how these expressions are arrived at and you'll be able to arrive them at them at any angle. So let's move on to the next expression. So on moving on to the next expression, it's going to take us back to our trajectory. But our trajectory here still, this is our projectile. It's moving like that. We were able to, to actually get two expressions by just utilizing this characteristic that when the particle is up here, when the velocity is zero, we we're able to get two expressions using that characteristic. We we're able to get the expression for maximum height reached. We we're also able to get the expression for the time taken to reach that maximum height. Just playing around with these equations of motion by just using that characteristic. Now there's another characteristic here. Here, it is at zero displacement. Yeah, the, the particle is at zero displacement. It's going to move up, then it's going to come back down. So you realize that as it is moving, uh, when it's moving in the, uh, in the upward direction, it is positive displacement. If it moves below this line downwards, in other words, if this particle is to go down like this, this would be negative displacement. This would be positive displacement, and here it would be negative displacement if it is going below this line. So we need to put that at the back of our mind. So in other words, when I kick a ball and it goes up, then it comes back down here. The displacement at this point is going to be zero, and the displacement at that point is also still going to be zero, as long as it is still in this horizontal range or in this horizontal plane so how can we use that characteristic can we plug in that characteristic in these formulas and when we do so what expression shall we be getting so let's proceed so of course as we proceed with that we know that the expression here that is having displacement we have this one, the second equation of motion. It is having displacement S. And here we are looking at the displacement in the Y direction. So the displacement is UT and this. So let's do that. It's going to be S. Displacement, first of all, S is going to be equal to UT plus a half a T squared. So uh, this displacement, let's say displacement in the y direction. Now we are looking at specific at this uh, displacement in the y direction. What is it? so the displacement in the y direction is going to be equal to so that is u times the sine of theta. That is the uh, this in the y direction times the time as it's moving upwards and downwards times the time. That's going to be plus, that's going to be a half. Multiply that by the acceleration due to gravity. Acceleration is negative since it is the, this particle is moving against gravity times negative g times the time. That is times time. Now, uh, we need to take note also that this value of t we are looking at here we are looking at displacement in the y direction. We are looking at uh, displacement in the y direction. And uh, this is the expression we have gotten. But now when the, ex the way, when, when the displacement is zero, when this value is zero, it means that this particle is either at this point or at that point. If the displacement is zero and this particle is at that point, it means that it will we will have we will be having the value of t will be the time for the entire flight when it is at that point so well, let's proceed if the displacement is zero that's the characteristic we are trying to maximize or we are trying to exploit when the displacement is zero this means it's going to become u sine theta times t so uh, what, uh, times t, all right. Then this is minus a half g t squared. Well, that is supposed to be squared. So again, from here, we 
can get this, take it that way. This becomes a half g t squared is going to be equal to u sine theta t. One of these t's will cancel with one of those. We shall end up with, uh, when we make t the subject of the formula, it's going to become u sine theta times 2 over g. This is the same as saying 2 u sine of theta over g. From what you can see, this 2 u sine theta g is going to be the time for the maximum time of flight. This is the expression for time of flight. That's the expression for time of flight. And if you to compare this expression to the expression we got earlier for time to reach maximum height. If you look at this, this is time to reach maximum height and then the time of flight. You know um, this is u sine theta. You see this one also u sine theta. It means that time to reach maximum height, you multiply it by two and you're able to get the time of the flight. Why is that? Because the time taken to reach the maximum height is just half the distance. So it means the time to come here to there is just this expression. Then it means it's going to be the same time to move from that maximum height to the end of the journey, to the end of the trajectory. So it means that this time to reach maximum height, if you multiply it by two, which is what we have attained here, if you multiply it by two, this times two is going to give us the time of the flight. I think you're able to see the relationship between the two. We're able to get this expression by just utilizing that piece of information, that characteristic, that at zero displacement, the vertical dis uh, at the starting point, that the vertical displacement is always zero. And we're able to plug that in here, and we're able to get that expression for time of the flight. Now, it, it, now, let's take note of this, that when you look at this expression in a way, the way it has been interpreted here, the calculations, this is more like a quadratic equation if you are to look at it. It has some characteristics of a quadratic equation. And if you are to interpret this as a quadratic equation, you would end up with two values of t. The first value of t will represent the time when the particle was at this point and the other value of t would represent the time when the particle had reached this point. In other words, if we were dealing with real figures and you plug in here the values of, you know, the values of theta and the values of u here, the way it is, you should be able to get two values of t because this is more like quadratic in nature. And when you get those two values of t, the first value of t is the time when it is here because that is when it is at zero displacement. The second value of t will be the time of flight. That is when the particle is here, when it has completed the journey, the trajectory. That is something to be explored in the calculations in the upcoming sessions. And now finally, we would like to look at the range, the horizontal range of this you know, when this ball is kicked, it goes out, up to there. What distance does it cover down here like that? Now, uh, remember before we were considering this motion in the vertical sense, yeah? But now here we are looking at distance moved from this point to that point. And that is more like distance in the horizontal direction. So how do we find that? We can find that using the simple formula of distance is equal to speed times time. So I'll simply come and say that the distance covered from here to there, the horizontal distance, is given by the speed. Multiply that by the time taken. So we shall ask ourselves, the distance moved here to there, it's what we are looking for, it's what we are calling range, let's call it capital R is going to be equal to the speed. Now the speed with which this thing is moving from here to here, remember, it means that this velocity here 
this time we are supposed to resolve it along the horizontal now resolving of forces is just the most previous session that we have been handling so resolving this velocity along this direction is going to be u cos theta we have resolved this velocity along that so that's acts at the speed times the time now what's the time what's the time taken for this distance to be covered when this particle is moving up and then it comes back down here what time does it go is it going to be taken definitely the time taken to cover this range is the same as the time taken by this particle when it is in air in other words it's the time of flight by the time this horizontal distance is covered by this particle that is moving up the time taken for it to be to be able to cover this is the time of the flight so it means the time here we are going to use is the time of flight and we derived the time of flight here uh, the time of flight is right there you know so this is going to be times this time of flight which is going to be 2 u times the sine of theta divided that by g and uh, the rest is just arithmetic this times that you're going to mind it's going to become um, u times u is u squared then times 2 cos theta sine theta divide all that by g and that's going to be equal to u squared now u squared using trigonometry actually this is more like you could even this is we've got in the final answer we're just trying to refine it if you look at this this is a trigonometrical identity that could mean um, sine to theta now this is trigonometry it's another topic in pure mathematics I am assuming that you have learned about this or you should be having prior knowledge about trigonometrical identities that 2 cos theta sine theta is the same as sine 2 theta so it means that this can be simplified further into u squared sine 2 theta divide that by g and this is the expression for our maximum range so we've got the expression for range and uh, the range here we're talking about is basically the horizontal range this distance here from here to there but when I was trying to derive this expression for range we used distance is equal to speed times time to arrive at it now somebody might ask me and is like but I thought for us to derive all these expressions we are only going to play around with these why is it that in this specific you know you know this specific derivation you started with distance is equal to speed times time where is this coming from let me answer that this distance is equal to speed times time this expression is actually coming from one of these expressions specifically it's coming from the expression or from the equation for displacement now take note previously when we were looking at this diagram here right here as you see well i explained the issue of uh, displacement in the positive direction and in the negative direction and that's the kind of displacement we were talking about when we are dealing with you know displacement in the y that's why i said this i put this as s subscript y as in displacement in the y direction and then we went ahead and did this now when we are looking at the distance here the range the distance covered in the x direction actually it is a, as same as the same way as saying it is displacement in the x direction so if we still used this same expression and we said now we are looking for the expression the distance in the x direction you will see how we arrive at this expression of distance is equal to speed times time so let me explain it further this is how it goes so we know that s this expression is equal to u t plus a half a t squared but now this range this distance is actually if this is displacement in the y direction then this is displacement in the x direction this one so it means this is displacement in the x direction is given by u t yeah plus a half 
at squared. So let's go on with the substitutions. Displacement in the x direction, which so happens to be sx, is going to be given by u. Now looking at our u here, remember here, we are supposed to resolve this u in the x direction. So if this is u sine theta, so in this direction, this is u cos theta. We are to resolve this initial velocity in the x direction. And so this is going to become our u times the cosine of theta. Multiply that by the time taken to cover this, this range, this distance, that is times t. And remember, the time taken to cover this is the same to, to, to cover the x distance or the to to, to cover the displacement in the horizontal direction is the same amount of time taken when the thing moved up and came down. We found that value of time in our earlier expressions. This is the time taken for the whole flight, time of flight, which is t to use that. So it is the expression, the value of t here. So that is going to be equal to, um, it's the same as this. Well, let me substitute this value of t direct here by putting that expression there. So this is going to become 2u sine theta over g, like that. So plus, remember we are following this, plus that is going to be a half times a times t. Now remember here we are looking at horizontal displacement. And in the horizontal displacement, the truth of the matter is that in the horizontal displacement, there is no gravity. Gravity only acts in the vertical displacement. In the horizontal displacement, there is no gravity. So it means this value of acceleration is zero. Now, if that value of acceleration is zero, it means that this whole term is going to die. And so this whole term is zero. So that if this whole time is zero, it means that as far as the the displacement in the x direction is concerned, or call it the horizontal displacement, we only have the velocity times the time. And so that's how you end up with our displacement in the x direction is going to be equal to, you know, this is 2 times u cos theta squared sine to theta over g. So from this, you're able to see that because now this thing is zero, you realize that what we are remaining with is displacement is equal to velocity times time. You realize that this expression is the same as saying displacement. Here, we the displacement here we called... You realize that here, the displacement here is the distance here. The velocity here is the speed and then the time. In other words, this is an expression. This is exp this expression is in vector form. In other words, this is uh, displacement distance. Displacement is um, a vector quantity. Distance is a scalar quantity. Velocity is a vector quantity. Speed is a scalar quantity. Whereas they are having the same units, one is a vector quantity, the other is a scalar quantity. So this is just an alternative approach. Oh, okay, this is explaining why I used, I simply went ahead and said distance is equal to speed times time and ended up with this expression. You see that we are ending up with the same expression, but actually where it is coming from is that it is all coming from this expression for displacement. Here is the displacement in the x direction, and then there is the displacement in the y direction. In our upcoming sessions, as we will be, you know, making these various calculations, we are going to be playing ar around with this expression a lot. And in this expression, we shall be, you know, showing displacement in the x direction, displacement in the y direction, coming up with the formulas, and then, you know, trying to find the missing links and the unknowns. So in this session, we've been able to derive some standard formula for projectile motion. We've been able to derive the expression for the horizontal range, the maximum horizontal range. We've been able to derive the expression for maximum height that a trajectory can reach, then the time taken to reach that maximum height plus the time taken for the entire flight. 
As I've been trying to derive this formula, you've been able to see how I was able to arrive at this formula. But more importantly, I would like you to see how we were able to derive this formula. Not all questions that we are going to do about projectile motion are going to require us to use these formulas that we have derived. Sometimes we are going to be, we are, we are going to, the, the formulas may not apply and you will need to reason out a number using the approach that we have used in this video. I'll give an example. For example, here we're able to use a reasoning behind that the, the displacement, the, the vertical displacement um, is zero at the beginning of the flight and at the end of the flight. But sometimes the displacement might not be zero. It might be another figure. So you should be able to know how to use this equation of motion to be able to get your answer depending on the question. So in our upcoming sessions, we are going to start doing some worked examples on the projectile motion. And some numbers might require us to use these formulas that we have derived. Some numbers might require us to reason them from, to reason them out from first principles. So I'll catch you in the upcoming sessions. Like this video if you like it. Don't forget to subscribe. Check out other sessions on this channel. Remember to share this video with your friends. My name is Arnold Rangakuramia and this is Kisembo Academy. Take care. This session we are going to answer that question to prove that the time of flight which has been denoted as capital T and the horizontal range, which is being denoted by capital R, are connected by that equation. Now, from our previous session, we've been able to derive the time of flight, capital T, and the horizontal range. So let's let me just write those formulas here. So the time of flight, capital T, we are able to see that the time of flight is two u, and the horizontal range R is given by. This is our finished product. We want to calculate to, to play around with these two in such a way that we come up with this as our finished product. So let's look at what items are in our finished products that are here so that we're able to identify what we need to eliminate. In our finished product, we have G, which is also there on both sides. Okay, we have capital T right there, which is also there. We have capital R which is also there. So you realize that in our finished product, we do not have U. U is not there. And of course, this sign and this sign, you know, these trigonometrical identities are being represented by this trigonometric identity turn. Somehow we shall get there. So at least one thing we have been able to establish that we do not have U. So since we do not have U, it means that let's find a way of eliminating U. If we can't find a way of eliminating U, maybe we'll be able to get to our finished product. So that's what we are going to do. So after identifying that, so how do we get rid of U from here? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make U the subject of this formula here. When I make U the subject of this formula, then I'm going to substitute that value of U in this expression. When I do so, this U will eventually disappear. So let's make you the subject of the formula in this expression. So I'll go ahead. Uh, you know, I can make this a flat equation by multiplying times G on both sides. So this becomes G times T is going to be equal to 2U sine of theta. So let's make you get along here. Divide both sides by 2 times sine. Divide both sides here by 2 sine. So that this two and that two go, this sign and that sign go. I mean sign theta, yeah? So you remain with u here. So our value of u here becomes g t over sign theta times two, right there. So we have isolated u, u is equal to that. So now that we have made u the subject of the formula, we substitute for u in this second expression right here, from here. So it means that this expression of ours let me do this on a fresh piece of, piece of paper. So it means that this uh, this is going to become R is going to be equal to U squared sine 2 theta over G.
So this is going to become where there is you, we put this expression here. We're substituting for you here. So it means that this u squared is going to become, it's going to become g t over 2 sine theta, like that. This whole thing is squared. Times sine 2 theta, divide that by g. I hope we are all together up to that point. So let's first deal with this top part before we get to over g. So this is going to become, so this is definitely g, this squared here is same as g squared times t squared, capital T squared, divide that by 2, 2 sine theta. So 2 squared is 4, then sine squared theta, sine squared theta. That is supposed to be multiplied by sine 2 theta. Now remember sine 2 theta is a trigonometrical identity which is the same as 2 sine theta cos theta. This is the same as 2 sine theta cos theta. Where is that coming from? That is coming from our trigonometrical identities. Trigonometry is a whole different topic. By the time we are doing this, I am assuming that you have some basic understanding of this trigonometrical identity. So this is going to be, multiply that by 2, sine theta cos theta. And all this divide by g. So all this divide by g, like that. So we shall handle the top part. This is, this sign goes with one of those signs, yeah, like that. This, this is sine squared, that is sine. So this one, this one is cancelled out with one of these two. So this becomes, again, we remain with g squared times t squared. Um, that is going to be over 4 sine, you know, theta. Multiply that by 2 sine 2 cos theta, like that. Divide that by g. This divide by g, let's call it divide that by g. Let's do it like that. It's going to be equal to r. Remember, we are still looking at, you know, it's r. So this is going to become g squared t squared. Divide that by 4. You know, now this is 4 sine theta. This is 2 by 2. Cancelled by 2 once by 2. Here remain with 2. So this can as well become 2 sine theta, multiply that by cos theta. This is divided by g over 1. We can multiply, we can make the reciprocal of this. This becomes times 1 over g. So this is going to become r is going to be equal to g squared t squared. Multiply that by the, the cosine of theta. Divide that by this times that, which is 2g sine theta is equal to r. Let's make, we, we make this a flat equation by, you know, multiplying this denominator on both sides. So multiplying that denominator on both sides is going to leave us with, you know, uh, this times that. Uh, this, this is times 2g sine theta. We multiply this on both sides. We end up with this times that is going to be r times this, which is times 2 g sine theta is going to be equal to this g squared t squared times the cosine of theta. Let's first check our final product. What do we want? We want to arrive at this expression. If we want to arrive at this expression, it has gt on one side. So from what we have so far, we have g here and we have t here. So we need to, you know, get rid of this cos away from here so that we only have this. And also g is not squared. Here g is squared. Actually, this is, we are supposed to have uh, cancelled out the g from this step here. So let's do that. We can also try to do it from here. This g cancels with one of the g's here. It's supposed, it would have been better done here that this g cancels out with one of those g so that the g up here remains one. So this g cancels out with one of those g's. This remains as r 
times that is two times r let's call it 2r the sine of theta sine theta is going to be equal to small g t squared now this is cos theta let's get rid of this cos theta since in our final product cos theta does not exist this way we want to leave gt on its own this on its own side so let's get rid of this so this becomes divide that by cos theta divide that by cos theta this cancels out with that we shall remain with g times t squared giving us here two times r now the sine theta over cos theta is tan theta from again trigonometrical identities so sine over cos is tan theta and you find that we've been able to prove that gt squared is going to be equal to that which is the same as that so next step is just a matter of rearranging it and you can simply come in and say gt squared is giving us two capital r tan theta so we've been able to answer the question as it is we've been able to prove that the time of flight capital t and that is equal to that so in our upcoming session we shall be doing some calculations like this video if you like it don't forget to subscribe don't forget to share this video with your friends my name is Arnold Rangakuramia and this is Kisembo Academy take care in today's session we're going to answer this question two footballers 120 meters apart stand facing each other one of them kicks the ball from the ground such that the ball takes off at that velocity at 38 degrees to the horizontal find the speed at which the second footballer must run towards the first footballer in order to tap the ball as it touches the ground if he starts running the instant the ball is kicked this is quite a lot of words let's summarize them into a diagram so here we go two footballers i have this footballer right here and i have another one here so two footballers are 120 meters apart so it means that the distance between them is 120 meters they stand facing each other as you can see one of them kicks the ball from the ground such that the ball takes off at a velocity of 30 meters per second so if this is the mafia that takes off kicks the ball when he kicks the ball it's going to take off at an initial velocity of 30 meters per second so that's our value of u it's at 30 meters per second at 38 degrees to the horizontal so as he's kicking off that ball this is the horizontal ground the, the it's at 38 degrees to the horizontal like that so the question says find the speed at which the second footballer must run towards the first footballer so this is the second footballer this second footballer is running towards the first footballer as this one is kicking so find the speed at which the second footballer must run towards the first footballer in order to tap the ball as it touches the ground in other words as this guy is kicking the ball as it's tapping the ground this guy is running to touch that ball as it's tapping the ground so in order to tap the ball as it touches the ground if he starts running the instant the ball is kicked meaning when this person kicks the ball this guy starts running and it so happens that as this ball is being kicked as it comes and drops on the ground here this guy is running the instant he kicks this guy starts running he's supposed to run a certain at a certain speed so that by the time he taps this ball by the time this ball reaches you know the ground this guy has reached he's able to tap it so at what speed is he able to run to get it so that's what the question wants the speed so what formula are we going to use to find the speed of this guy as he's running of course if you look at the formulas we have to use you know you consider from the question I think um, people here straight away might get confused with, you know, this is a projectile motion, what projectile equation am I supposed to use and all these things, but I th it is the very question that gives us what to do. The question says, um, find the speed right here. 
find the speed at which the second foot bowler must run. So let's concentrate on this, and that is what is going to give us what to do. So this is the second bowler, foot bowler is running at. What speed is he going to run at? So we know that, well, distance is given by speed times time. This is for objects that are running in a straight line, yeah, like this guy. If he's running, distance is speed times time, so we want the speed at which he's going to run. So it means that if I make speed the subject of the formula, speed will be given by distance over time. Yeah. So if I'm to find the speed with which this guy is running, I need to find the distance he's going to cover. Now from here we are able to see that the, dis the distance between these two is 120 meters. So it means the distance is supposed to cover is that distance. It is definitely less than 120 meters. And also I need to find the time. How am I going to find the time? So here is the logic. The distance covered here is going to be 120 minus that distance. 120 minus that distance gives us the distance he covered. But 120 minus that distance, this distance you realize is actually the range of the projectile. So in other words, for me to be able to get this distance, I just need to find the range of this projectile, the distance covered by this projectile motion. If I'm able to get the range, then I'm able to get 120 minus that range, I get the distance covered by this guy. So we know how to find the distance. What about the time covered? Remember, he starts running the instant the ball is kicked. So if he starts running the instant the ball is kicked, it means that the time taken for this ball to be kicked to move from here up to there is the same time he takes to run to reach it because he starts running when the ball is kicked. So it's the motion is like that. Yeah. In other words, the time taken by the flight is the same time taken for this guy to run to there. So to find the time taken by this guy to run is the same as the time taken by this flight. So meaning we can find the time. Since we've discovered how to find the time, we've interpreted the question fully. Now we can get started with the working. We shall go in, we're going to go ahead and you know, find the distance covered by the range. Now there we're just going to use formulas. These are formulas we derived in our previous session. What is the time, the range, the horizontal range of that projectile is given by. So the range, which we are denoting as capital R, is given by sine. So this is going to become u squared, the value of u is actually 30. So it's going to become 30 squared times uh, the sine of 2 times the angle, 2 times theta, which is 2 times theta. The value of theta here is 38 times 38. Divide that by the gravity. Our value of gravity will be 9.81. Unless otherwise, for my videos, my value of gravity will always be 9.81 unless otherwise stated. And so our vertical, our horizontal range is going to become 89. So we get 89.018 meters. So in other words, this means that the distance, the horizontal distance here is 89.018 meters. So now that we know the distance of this, the, that was traveled by the ball, so we are able to get the distance that this guy covered here. So it's going to be 120 minus that to get this remaining distance, this man run. So meaning that the distance in this case come 120 meters minus 89.018 meters and this is definitely going to give us 13.98 meters now we found the distance that this man has been covered here so it is 30.98 meters right there so now that we found the distance what about the time? Remember, our guide is this formula. We want to find the speed of this guy. We have found the distance. Now, what time did, does he move? 
from here to there. Remember the time taken is the same as the time of this ball moving like that because the question tells us that he starts running at the instant this ball is kicked. So the time taken here for this ball to reach there is the same time he takes he should take to run to reach the ball. So at the time of this flight again we're going to use a formula to find the time. We derived this formula in our previous sessions. We know that time of flight is given by 2u sine of theta, divide that by g. So this is going to become 2 times u, which is, our value is 30, times the sine of that angle theta, which is 38 right there, divide that by 9.81. And so what's the answer? This is going to give us 3.76. 3.765 seconds. That's the time. So now that we know the time, we can go ahead and plug it here and we go ahead and find answer the question which requires us to find the speed by which that guy moved. So to answer the question directly now that we've got the information we need, we shall go back here and say so our the speed of the man is given by distance over time. The distance covered, we got it here, 120 minus that, which was 30.98, so it's going to be 30.98 meters, divide that by the time taken, which is 3.765 3 seconds, and definitely we end up with our speed as 8.2 meters per second. And that right there is the speed. That, and so that answers our question right there. That brings us to the end of this session. In our upcoming session, we get to do another worked example. Like this video if you like it. Don't forget to subscribe and don't forget to share this video with your friends. My name is Arnold Rangakuramia. This is Kisembo Academy. Take care. A projectile is fired from the ground level with a velocity of 500 meters per second, 30 degrees to the horizontal. Find the horizontal range. I like to summarize my questions with a diagram. This is the projectile they're talking about. It's fired from the ground level. The initial velocity here, our value of u, is 500 meters per second. 500 meters per second and the angle here is 30 degrees. All this is to the horizontal, find the horizontal range. So one, they want us to find the horizontal range. Again, formula for horizontal range are, I'm now answering Roman one. Formula for horizontal range is given by u squared sine two, three, two divide all that by g. We derived these formulas in our previous sessions. Our u squared is 500 squared. Multiply that by the sine of 2 times the angle which is 30. Divide that by 9.81. It is that simple. So this gives us and that's it. That's our Roman 1, that's the horizontal range. So Roman 2, they tell us to find the greatest height to which it rises. Again, to find the greatest height to which it rises. Roman 2, we derive the formula for this. Formula for greatest height, which is capital H, is given by... That's the formula for the greatest height reached. We derived this formula in our previous sessions. This is going to be given by u squared, which is 30 squared times sine squared times the angle theta, which is 30. Divide that by 2g, which same is 2 times 9.81. And this is going to become, and that is our Roman 2. The greatest height reached is 3,185 meters. Moving on to Roman 3. Find the least speed with which it could be projected in order to achieve the same horizontal range. So the question is asking for the least speed it should take 
for it to be able to reach uh, you know the same horizontal range now they're talking about horizontal range and uh, the horizontal range we have achieved here is uh, this right there so there are, the, in other words the question is asking what least speed in other words what is what value of u the least value of u that we can attain we, we, we can have to get the same value of r in, in other words we're playing around with this right here let me re-quote this formula. We are talking about range here. We know that our value of range is given by u squared sine 2 theta. Divide that by g. The question says, find the least speed. Find the least value of u, you know, the least speed. Find the least speed with which it could be projected in order to achieve the same horizontal range. The same horizontal range, in other words, the same value of r. Let's make you the subject of this formula because we want to find this, the least value of this. So when we make you the subject of the formula, um, here it becomes our value of u becomes g times r divide that by sine 2 theta this is u squared yeah it's like that so we need to find the least value of u when you look at this expression for me to be able to get the least value of u it means that my denominator has to be a maximum figure you know this must be as it at its very maximum for me to be to be able to get the smallest number of u the denominator uh, i'm dividing this divide by that however um the logic here is this as i'm dividing this figure divide that by that figure as i'm dividing these two the bigger this figure, the smaller the answer I get. If this becomes smaller and smaller and smaller, while this one is remaining constant, if this becomes smaller and smaller and smaller, it means I'll be getting a bigger and bigger and bigger answer. However, if this figure is constant and this new denominator becomes bigger and bigger and bigger, the bigger this denominator becomes, then the smaller my answer will be. You could go and try it out with a fraction. Or we could even try it out now if I am having 10 over 2. 10 over 2 is equal to 5. If I increase this denominator to a higher number, I say 10 over 4, the answer I'm going to get is 2.5. If I continue and say what is 10 over 6, I'm going to end up with 1.66. From this simple illustration, what you're able to see is that as I keep increasing the denominator, I mean, when, as I keep increasing the denominator, my answer here becomes smaller and smaller. The bigger the denominator, the smaller the answer I get. So it's the same logic we are looking using here. That if the question says they want us to find the least speed, in other words, if I am to get the least value of u here, it means as far as this expression is concerned, my numerator has to be at its maximum, the biggest possible numerator. Now, as far as this goes here, we have sine 2 theta. That is what is in our numerator. And the maximum value of sine 2 theta is 1. Again, how am I able to find one? These are details in the topic called trigonometry. By the time you are doing this topic, the one of the prerequisites is that you must have covered trigonometry in your class. On this channel, trigonometry, the topic is yet to be covered. So this means that u squared here is going to become g times r divide that by this is equal to 1 that's the maximum value of sine 2 theta it is 1 that is coming from trigonometrical theories i will not go deep into those details for now but if you want me to explain that let me know in the comment section below so meaning that we'll go ahead and find our value of u instead so moving on with our calculations our u squared is giving us g, which is 
multiply that by the value of r the range in this case the range we got was 22069 remember the question is telling us to find the max the minimum the the least possible value of u to attain the same range so this is 9.81 multiply that by 2 And so that's the answer right there. So with that, we've been able to answer that question. In our upcoming session, we get to do another worked example on projectile motion. Like this video if you like it. Don't forget to subscribe if you've not yet subscribed. Check out other videos on the channel. Remember to share this with your friends. My name is Arnold Rangakuramia, and this is Kisembo Academy. Take care. In this session, we get to answer this question about projectiles. A body is thrown from the top of a tower 34, 30.4 meters high with a velocity of 24 meters per second at an elevation of 30 degrees above the horizontal. Find the horizontal distance from the roof of the tower to the point where it hits the ground. We need to find the horizontal distance. First step is to always get a diagrammatic view of the question. So. A body is thrown from the top of a tower. So this is the tower. We have a body right there. And this body is being thrown from the top of the tower like that. So the tower is 30.4 meters high. So this is 30.4. It's 30.4 meters high with a velocity of 24 meters per second. So the velocity with which this thing is being thrown, u is equal to 24 meters per second at an elevation of 30 degrees above the horizontal. So meaning uh, the elevation, the angle of elevation here is 30 degrees. Let me write it there. So the angle of elevation there is 30 degrees above the horizontal. Find the horizontal distance from the roof of the tower to the point where it hits you know the ground this is the tower and right down here this is our ground right there and they want us to find the horizontal distance so the horizontal distance is the distance from the roof to where it hits the ground this is where it hits the ground they want us to find this horizontal distance right there so unlike the numbers we've been doing previously in our in our previous sessions, you find that this is a bit different. The ones we've been doing previously, the particle starts from the same ground level and it goes up and comes back down on the same ground level. And in this, but for here, the point of projection is on top of a tower. However, it is moving up to down there. So they want us to find the horizontal distance from the point where it is projecting up to where the thing ends. Yeah find the horizontal distance from the roof, you know, from the roof, the horizontal distance to where it, it drops. That's the distance they're talking about. Okay, so just one thing that we need to know with this. Now, if you look at this, this is a bit irregular. So with this, it is, uh, we can't apply the formulas that we've derived before. Now, the formulas that we have derived before will only apply when we are dealing with perfect conditions. By perfect conditions, I mean a projectile starts from the same ground level. It goes up and it comes down on the same ground level. That's when we can f apply the formula for horizontal range, for maximum height, and the time of flight. We can apply them. But this is not a perfect condition. This condition here you're seeing, it's like this. This is the platform where we started from. It started, it moved up a bit. Then on coming down, it exceeded. In other words, the trajectory went and exceeded where it stopped and it dropped somewhere down here. And so it means that we need to use, the, to apply first principles. We are supposed to interpret it from first principles to be able to get what we are, re, what they need from us. Um, when we are using the formula, when we are asking for maximum range, when we want to find the time for maximum range, we simply apply the other formula we derived to find the time for maximum range. 
but in this case we are being required to find some extra distance you know there is this time for maximum range then there is this extra distance here from this point up to where it lands that is what we are talking about here in other words here our point of projection is this this is the point of projection but this falls way beyond and goes down here and we need to find this distance now this is not as perfect as this is so it means we are going to do this using one of the three equations of motion and we are going to do it from first principles now this is one thing that you need to know that when this particle is at this point its displacement is zero if it is moving upward its displacement is a positive one if it is moving downwards its displacement is a negative one as in that is if it is below this line so in other words as this particle keeps its displacement from this position as it's here its displacement is in the positive direction okay so when it comes here and it moves down its displacement is negative as long as it's below this line now i'm trying to explain this but if you've already covered the difference between distance and displacement I expect that you should have covered that by the time you're doing this topic and so you should be in position to understand perfectly what I mean as I explain this displacement thing. I'm only saying it for some of us that may not be understanding what's going on. So let's get back to this diagram here. We are required to find this distance. Um, again, it's just about playing around with the equations of motion. We talked about those equations of motion in our previous session and here they are this so you just look at these three equations of motion and ask yourself which of these three equations of motion is most likely to give you what you want they want us to find the horizontal distance but then at the horizontal distance from the point of projection we know that this point here is like our zero ground our ground zero if i'm to be displaced up my displacement up will be a positive one my displacement downwards is going to be a negative one. And we know that by the time this particle moves from this point to come and land on this ground, remember, our zero level is the, 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 the level where the projection starts from. If the projection was starting from the ground, this would be our zero level. When the projection starts from here, it means now this is our zero level. And so if this projection is falling below the zero level, it means it is being displaced in the negative sense. However, we know that its displacement is negative. Why? Negative 30.4. Because this tower is 30.4 meters tall, it means this point, it moved up positive displacement then it came down and it went downwards to the ground by 30.4 meters down in other words 30.4 it is its displacement at this at the time it hits the ground is 30.4 meters that is its displacement in the y direction or in the vertical direction so so what do they want let's get back to our diagram here uh, they want the horizontal distance. The horizontal distance from the roof of the tower to the point where it hits the ground. This is the distance they want. Let's call that distance M. That's the distance they want you to find. Now, this is the horizontal distance that they want. And we know that this distance is given by speed times time. That's the, the distance given. That's the distance. Distance is p times time. So, looking at the distance, yeah? We are looking at distance in the x direction. We are looking at horizontal distance. We are not looking at the vertical distance. The vertical distance would be this displacement. But here, it is that. So, it means that find the distance, we need the speed. And in this case, the speed, we are going to... Dis the, we are supposed to resolve this speed in the horizontal direction so it means that the distance here is going to be equal to the speed which is going to be u times the u cosine of 24 this u times cosine of 24 is the distance in the horizontal direction multiply that by the time now we do not know the time but we need to know the time covered as this particle moves from here up to there 
so the speed has been it is u cosine of 24 remember we're doing this from first principles using the equations of motion so uh, u cos that times time now the time is what we're supposed to find using the equations of motion so like I have explained earlier, when you look at s is equal to ut plus a half at squared, and you look at this, you find that the displacement here is negative 30.4. This particle falls below the zero level by negative 30.4. So meaning our value of s here will be negative 30.4. So when you plug it in here, we will be able to get the time. We will be getting two values of t. One uh, with two values of t and we shall choose one of them that applies to when the particle drops at this level So let's first find the value of t when we get the value of t Then we shall come back and plug it in here and then we shall go ahead and get the distance This value of m. So let's get to it So we know that s is equal to ut plus a half a t squared We are using this from first principles what is the displacement s? The displacement is in the negative sense. In this case, it is negative 30.4. So we shall get, we shall say this is negative 30.4. So negative 30.4 is given by ut. Now the u, um, ut, in this case, remember we're doing this from first principles. So, and this is s in the y direction. So because it is in the y direction, it means you're supposed to resolve this initial velocity in the y direction. So it's going to be u sine of 24. Times the time. Then it's going to become plus a half. Times acceleration, since it is going upward here, it's against gravity. Times negative g squared like that so this all becomes negative 30.4 is equal to u our u is 24 so it's 24 oh this is supposed to be sine of 30 the degrees the it is 30 degrees the theta value of theta is 30 so it's 24 sine of 30 times t that is going to be uh, minus a half times the gravity which is going to become 9.81 times t squared so when we simplify this further this is what we come up with this is 12 t and this is 4.9 t squared we rearrange this to form a quadratic equation as you can see so if this is uh if we put we rearrange this to make it a quadratic equation this is going to become 4.9 t squared we are going to we are pushing everything on one side so this becomes 4.9 t squared minus 12 t um minus 30.4 is equal to zero that's a quadratic equation right there so when you solve this quadratic equation punch it in your calculator or use the quadratic formula you will end up with two values of t one of the value of t is 4 another value of t is 1.5 so of these two values of t this is negative 1.5 so of these two values of t which one are you going to choose now these are the two values of t we are getting when the displacement is negative 30.4 in other words at negative 30.4 the displacement if if i'm to complete this curve this is what this means if i'm to redraw it here again this is our tower we hit a, something here and it came like that up to there at this ground this is 30.4 this is the zero ground zero level so this is more like an extension right there we can extend this graph arbitrary up to this 30.4 so what this means is that this value of t is equal to negative 1.5 this is the value of t here negative 1.5 
if we are to extrapolate this thing to up to there. And then this second value of t4 is the value of t at that point. So between the two, we are interested in the time taken for this particle to heat at this point, not at that point. And besides, we even negative 1.5 as a negative time is not realistic. So we take the higher value here, which is 4 seconds. So it means our value of t here is 4 seconds. It's the one we have. It's the value of the time taken for the particle to move from that point to come up to there. In meaning, it's the time taken to move from here to there, to cover this horizontal distance. So our value of t is 4. It's what we are going to take. Now that our value of t is 4, now we can come back to our initial formula here and complete and answer the question as it is required. So here it's going to become uh, distance is p times time, which is u cos 24 times t. This is the same as saying u, u is 24 meters per second, so it's 24 times the cosine of, actually this is supposed to be 30. I'm sorry, the angle there is 30. So it's u cosine of 30, multiply that by the time. The time here is 4 seconds. And the answer we get, it's 83.138 meters. So that is the distance here. And so with that, we are able to answer that question. This brings us to the end of this session. Thanks for watching. In our next session, we get to do yet another worked example on projectile motion. Don't forget to share this video with your friends. My name is Arnold Ranga Kuramia. This is Kisembo Academy. Take care. A body is projected at such an angle that the horizontal range is three times the greatest height. Given that the range of the projection is 400 meters, find the necessary velocity of projection and the angle of projection. That's the question we are going to do today in this session. Let's get to it. So, a body is projected at an angle that such that the horizontal range R. Let's summarize this question that the horizontal range is three times the greatest height. So right here, we are being told that the horizontal range is... The horizontal range is three times the greatest height. R is going to be equal to three H. That is an expression from the question that the horizontal range is three times the greatest height. So they are telling us that given that the range of projection is 400 meters, if the range is 400 meters, given that the range of projection is 400 meters, find the necessary velocity of projection and the angle of projection. So if the range is 400 meters, they want you to find the velocity of projection. So they want us to find us the value of u. And the angle of projection, that is the value of theta, also needs to be found. Now the value of u and the value of theta are embedded within the equations of range and the equation of maximum height, equations which we derived earlier. I mean, in the earlier sessions. Okay, so let's use this information to create some equations, these relations, and then we'll go ahead and find the value of u and the value of theta, like the question requires us to. So first of all, what's the equation for range? What's the equation for maximum height? We derived this in our earlier sessions, and this is what we came up with. We were able to establish that the range is given by u squared sine to theta divided that by g. That's our expression for range. And then the expression for maximum height is given by maximum height of a projectile is given by. So let's do this. R is equal to 400 meters. Let's plug this in here. Let's see where it takes us. So we know that our range is 400 meters. What is our range? The expression for range is this. So it becomes u squared sine 2 theta over g is given by 400 meters. So from here, we um, you could, g is 9.8. We want u, we want theta. Remember our question wants us to find u and theta, yeah? But we know g is 9.81. So this means that u squared times the sine of two theta 
uh, divide that by 9.81 gives us 400 meters. And if we are to multiply this on both sides, 9.81 times 9.81 on both sides, this goes with that. We shall remain with u squared sine to theta, giving us this times that, giving us 3,924. So let's consider this our equation one. We shall come back to it. We can't go any further than this because we have two unknowns. We have theta, we have u. We can't go any further than that. So let's call that our equation one. We shall come back to it in case we are able to get any of this. So let's get to the second expression. Our second expression here, r is equal to 3h. We are also able to get an expression out of it. So let's go ahead and get an expression out of this relation. And we see where that expression leads us to. So this expression, r is equal to 3h. What is our value of r here? We substitute for value of r, it's this. So it's going to be u squared sine of 2 theta, divide that by g, is going to give us 3h. 3 times h, which so happens to be this. u squared sine squared theta, divide that by 2g, like that. So we go ahead and simplify this and see where it takes us. So, um, this becomes, you know, we can see that this u squared and that u squared are going to cancel out automatically. This value of g and that g will cancel out automatically. And then from here, we have sine 2 theta. Sine 2 theta, let's break it down. Sine 2 theta is the same as 2 sine theta cosine theta is equal to 3 times the sine squared theta that is 3 over 2 yeah so if I multiply these two on both sides this 2 and that 2 go cancel out this sign and that sign squared these are two signs so this sign cancels out with one of the signs here and so here we shall remain with 2 times 2 which is 4 cosine of theta giving us 3 sine theta so from here we can divide both sides by cos so that this cos and that cancel out this is cos theta so we remain with 4 giving us 3 times sine over cos is tan times tan theta so we make tan theta the subject of the formula. So, uh, you realize here we only have one unknown. So we make tan theta the subject of the formula so that we are able to get, you know, the value of theta. So this is how we will go about it. To become tangent of theta is equal to 4 over 3. We divide by 3 on both sides here and it becomes 4 over 3 equal to tan theta. And so it means our value of theta is going to be equal to tan inverse of 4 over 3 and we end up with our value of theta here as 53.130 degrees that's our value of theta so we're able to get our value of theta let's get back to our question our question requires us to find theta and u we have found theta as 53.130 now let's go ahead and find u but we can get u from our first equation. Our first equation expression we got here, we can now substitute for the value of theta there, and then we go ahead and find the value of u as it is required. So from there, we can go ahead and complete this. We know that u squared sine two theta, which is just this, I'm just recopying this, is given by three, nine, two, four. So this becomes to get a u times sine over, you know, two times theta. Our value of theta in this case, we got our value of theta back here as 53.130. Two times 53.130 is equal to this, 3924. So you find that when we plug that in in our calculator, we shall end up with u giving us three we make you the subject for the formula it gives us three nine two four 
divide that by the sine of this. We need the square root of that. And so when you plug it in our calculator, we're able to get that answer. We're able to get the value of u as 63.93 and our value of theta right there. By doing that, we are able to answer the question that a body is projected at that angle. And from that, we were able to find the velocity they asked for and the angle of projection. That brings us to the end of this session. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button. Don't forget to hit that like button if you like this video. I encourage you to share this video with your fellow students. My name is Arnold Ranga Kuramia and this is Kisembo Academy. Take care. So what we have here, a ball is projected horizontally with a velocity of that from a point of that meters above the ground level. Find the time taken for the ball to reach the ground and the horizontal distance traveled during that time. Let's summarize this with a diagram, shall we? So they are being told us that a ball is projected horizontally with a velocity of that from a point 78.4 meters above the horizontal ground. So we have a horizontal ground here, as you can see, right? And at a certain point, the question says, and this point is 78.4 meters, 78.4 meters above this horizontal ground, a ball has been projected, that a ball is projected horizontally. When a ball is projected horizontally, remember before we've been dealing with, uh, you know, balls being projected at a certain angle to the horizontal, yeah? In other words, this is the horizontal, and if something is projected at a certain angle theta to the horizontal. But it's not the case here. Now they're being, we're being told that the ball is projected horizontally, meaning that it's coming off like that, horizontal. There's no angle. It's being projected horizontally, like that. So it's being projected horizontally from with a velocity of that. So the velocity here is 20 meters per second. It's being projected horizontally with a velocity of, it is 20 meters per second from a point and it is 78.4 meters above the horizontal ground. This is our horizontal ground and we are looking at 78.4 meters above the horizontal ground. So we are being told to find, first of all, the time taken for the ball to reach the ground and the horizontal distance. Now, contrary to what we have been doing much earlier, remember we derived some equations for the projectile motion. Those equations for projectile motion for finding the time of flight, the range, and the maximum height, those apply for, you know, perfect projectiles. By perfect projectiles, I mean a projectile that has been projected from the point on the horizontal ground, it goes up, and then it comes back down there. That's a perfect one. We can get the time, the horizontal range, using the formula we derived earlier, we can get the time reach taken to reach maximum height using the formulas we derived earlier we can get the time of the entire flight using the formulas we got earlier we can also got get the distance the maximum height reached using the previous you know formulas that we used but in this case this is not a perfect one and because it is not we are going to have to approach this using you know the equations of motion we approach it using first you know, from first principles we are going to do it like that. So, remember we said that the point of projection is our zero level. This right here is our zero level here. That's our point of projection. This is our zero level. It means as far as displacement goes, if a projectile is going upwards, that is positive displacement. That's the value of S is positive. If the particle is moving downwards from this zero level, it is negative. And in this case, if this is our point of projection and the projectile is being projected horizontally at that speed, it is moving downwards and it is ending up below the zero level from the point of projection, then meaning that the displacement as at this point is in the negative sense. So what does this mean? This means that if this tower is 78.4 meters right there, and this is where we projected from. This is our point of projection. It means when this thing was projected, it went, it was displaced by negative 78.4 meters below, you know, below the zero level or the point of projection. So that is the interpretation of this. And so when they tell us to find the time taken for the ball to reach the ground, what is the time? So we're going to use the second equation of motion 
the equation where that has the displacement and in the place of displacement we shall put negative 78.4 this is how we should do it so from here we know that s is equal to ut plus a half a t squared we all know that equation it's familiar when this ball was projected from here by the time it was hitting the ground it had traveled 78.4 meters below the zero level or below the point of projection so the displacement that is in the y direction the displacement in the y direction is negative 78.4 that is going to be giving us u now take note this when we are using this formula it means we are doing things from first principles this expression we are using we are looking at displacement in the y direction you know remember displacement is a vector quantity so we're doing displacement in the y direction and in the y direction it is negative 78 that is going to be equal to the velocity our velocity here is also supposed to be in the y direction if you look at our point of projection here our velocity is directly in the x direction it is it is the ball is being projected horizontally it is being projected in the x direction so meaning it's being if it's being directed in are projected in the x direction as far as this is concerned there is no there, there is no vertical component of this velocity it's all in the horizontal so there's no vertical component of this velocity so since there is no vertical component there it means that this is you know zero it's like saying it's like saying u times the sine of zero and the sine of zero is zero so meaning that there's no vertical component of this velocity since it's not inclined at any angle so this is going to be zero times the time taken that's going to become plus a half times gravity this it's uh, gravity is negative g times t squared so meaning uh, this is going to become negative 78.4 is going to be equal to all this is zero so this is going to become minus a half times gravity times t squared this negative cancels out with that negative and we shall remain with our value of t here uh, 78.4 is going to give us um, a half g t squared so this is going to become 2 times 78.4 is going to uh, divide that by g g is 9.81 is equal to t squared so to make t the subject of the formula t is going to be 2 times 78.4 divided by g which is 9.81 all this is under the square root so we are able to get our value of t the time the value of t here is four seconds of course when we are dealing with square root this is plus or minus so it is either plus four seconds or minus four seconds of course we shall take the positive value and that is going to be positive four the minus four means that the thing the minus four applies for when the thing is this way i explained that in our previous session you get what i mean so this is four seconds that is the time taken. So we've answered the first part of the question. The first part of the question is that find the time taken for the ball to reach the ground and using the second equation of motion, doing everything from first principles, that is using this equation in the context of, you know, the vertical displacement, we're able to get the time taken for the thing to reach. So, and the, the question continues to say, and find the horizontal distance, find the horizontal distance traveled during that time. So what is the horizontal distance? So if you look at the horizontal distance in this case, when they speak of horizontal distance, they are talking about the time taken for this thing to move from this point to that point, that distance. That's horizontal. So meaning that if it's the horizontal distance, we know that distance is given by speed times time. What's the distance, the speed? Now look at the speed here. The speed, remember this thing was projected according to the question. A ball is projected horizontally. So this thing is entirely in the horizontal direction. So here it's going to be the horizontal direction is, you know, it's like saying there is no need to resolve it. Or if you are to resolve it, you say you, there is no angle between the direction of this 
this point of this projection and the horizontal in other words the direction in which this particle was projected and the horizontal they are all lying in the same plane so the angle there is zero so if even if you are to say you want to resolve it along the horizontal it would be u cosine of zero u cosine of zero still the cosine of zero is one so in other words it is going to be u times one so the horizontal distance the horizontal uh, velocity is 20 which, which is the speed multiply that by the time taken so now what is the time taken for this thing to move from here up to there we found the time taken in our previous calculation which was four seconds so it's going to be 20 times 4 and that is going to give us 80 meters and so with that we are able to answer question fully and this brings us to the end of this session thanks for watching remember to share this video with your friends i'll catch you in the next session where we'll get to do another worked example my name is arnold rangakuramia and this is kisembo academy Okay, thanks for tuning in. My name is Arnold Rangakramia, and in today's session, we get to answer this question. The question says that a tennis ball is served horizontally from a height 2.4 meters and 12 meters from a net which is 0.9 meters high. If the ball clears the net by at least 0.2 meters, what is the minimum initial speed and where will it land? Let's summarize this question in a diagram. So we're going to draw a diagram here to summarize this question. So this is the tennis ball. It has been served horizontally from a height 2.4 meters. So this is the height we're talking about right there. It is 2.4 meters. That's where the tennis ball has been served from, from that height. And the question continues to say it has been served horizontally from a height 2.4 meters and 12 meters from a net. So it is 12 meters from a certain net. The net is right here. And uh, from a net which is 0 0.9 meters high. So this net is 0 0.9 meters high. If the ball clears the net by at least 0 0.2 meters. So meaning that if, as this ball is being served, if it just clears the net by 0 0.2 meters, that means that if it goes above this net by just 0 0.2, 0.2 meters if it clears the net by just 0 0.2 meters um, What is the minimum initial speed so this speed here the value of u here is not known and we need to find it So what is the minimum initial speed then to where will it land? We shall come to Roman 2 later. Let's start with Roman 1. What is its initial speed when it just clears the top of this net? So let's get started with that Again, this is not a perfect trajectory. In other words, it's not the kind of trajectory where we are going to um, apply the equations that we derived. Like I keep saying, the equations we derived are normally apply to a trajectory that is perfect like that. From here, this is where you can apply the equations we derived, where you can find the equation for maximum height, where you can apply the equation for range and then the equation for time of flight. That is when the trajectory looks perfect like that. But this is not perfect. And so, because it's not perfect, it means we're supposed to solve the number using equations of motion from first principles. And the one that we normally, we, we commonly use is this one. S is equal to UT plus a half AT squared. The equation for displacement. Why? Because as this ball is running, it is normally displaced along the x, I mean along the y axis and along the x axis. There is normal, it's normally displaced along those axes and from there we are able to come up with some equations that will help us to, you know, find a few unknowns here and there. One more thing before we go into the number is uh, the thing when I also like to emphasize when something has been projected from here and it goes up and then it comes back down like that this is our zero level you know so when the, disp when the particle goes up 
that is positive displacement if it comes and goes beyond this zero level and starts moving downwards that is negative displacement and the negative displacement here we are talking about displacement in the y direction take note of that so when you look at um something like this a ball is projected from here and then it falls like this this is like saying the ball was up here and then it was kicked and it went here but because it has it, it, its point of projection is here this means that now the zero level is has shifted to up there you know it's the point of projection that is going to dictate where the the you know the, the point of projection is where it's the, that is where we are going to determine the zero level from so this is our zero level and so if it is moving down it means it is moving below the point of projection and so this would be negative displacement and upwards would be positive displacement that's just how it is so let's get into this now so meaning from here we know that as this one is being projected from this point to come down here because this is the point of projection it means that this right here is our zero level because this is the point of projection this is where the thing was and so if any any displacement is negative negative displacement in the y direction yeah so let's get started like i said when we are uh, doing these kinds of numbers from, from first principles it's going to be we're going to play around with s is equal to ut plus a half a t squared now we're going to look at displacement this ball by how much has it been displaced in the x direction and by how much has it been displaced in the y direction if you see that it is here in the x direction it has been we are going to look at uh, it has been displaced we have some information here in the x direction it has been displaced 12 meters right there in by the time it reaches this point as the ball moves to here to there it has been displaced 12 meters in the x direction and then it has been displaced by that distance in the y direction what's that distance remember we are counting from the zero level this is the value of x this is the value of y in the value of x it has been displaced 12 meters in the x direction in the y direction it has been displaced what is that so we know that this is 24 meters so 24 i mean 2.4 meters so 2.4 minus 1.1 we get 1.3 i hope we are not confused let me do the, let me emphasize this again in the x direction by the time the ball is here in the x direction it has been displaced in other words the displacement in the x direction here is the 12 meters from here to there then in the y direction to reach here this is 2.4 meters this is 0 0.9 plus 0 0.2 which is 1.1 so 2.4 minus 1.1 gives us 1.3 so in other words this is our displacement in the y direction when the ball has reached that point so since we have our x and y it's like displacements then we can use this ex expression to find out what they want in this case they want us to find the value of u so let's get started with the working so let's begin with um, displacement in the y direction. Displacement in the y direction is given by u t plus a half g t squared. That's going to be given by what is the value of u? Now the initial velocity in the you know in the y direction remember the question says that this tennis ball has been served horizontally if it has been served horizontally it would mean that there's no component of this velocity in the y direction maybe this is another way to put it remember pre previously we've been dealing with where the velocity goes up at a certain angle theta yeah this is velocity u yes and so meaning that if we are looking at velocity in the y direction we would resolve this by saying it is u um sine of theta that would be 
velocity in the y direction then in the x direction we would resolve this velocity along the x direction and we would say it is u cosine of theta yeah but now in this case this velocity is acting within the x direction that means that the value of theta is zero that's what the question says that the tennis ball has been served horizontally so if it is acting within the x direction it means that the value of theta here is zero so if it is zero let's put so meaning that in the sense of y what is sine zero if we say u sine of zero the sine of zero is zero so it means that it's going to become u times zero u times zero is going to give us zero so that means that in the y direction here this u sine of zero means that there is no component of the velocity in the y direction because this thing is all in the x direction so this term is going to die because of this explanation and of course later on when we, we come to the x thing what is u cosine of zero cosine of zero is one so u times one is u so the component of velocity in the x direction will be u but we shall come to this so this here as we are substituting this in here it's going to become this is zero because there is no component of the velocity in the y direction so zero of course this is plus a half gravity is in the negative direction minus g t squared This is equal to the displacement in the y direction we're looking at it at this point uh, that is uh, at, the, at that point the displacement is one negative 1.3 because it is in the negative direction so this is negative 1.3 like that so this becomes negative 1.3 is going to be equal to negative you know negative g which is 9.8 1 negative 9.81 over 2 and that is t squared multiply both sides by 2 you end up with negative of course these negatives will go we we'll end up with 2.6 divide that by 9.81 giving us t squared and our value of t here when we find the square root on both sides here we end up with that is 0 0.5148 this is in seconds so that is what we ended up when we did displacement in the y direction so in other words this value of t that's the time it takes for this ball to move from there up to that point so now that we have used we have done displacement in the y direction what about the displacement in the x direction let's do it right there So the displacement in the x direction that is x in the x direction still it's going to be ut plus a half g t squared displacement in the x direction is 12 meters so we shall come and say 12 meters is going to be equal to u now remember this is what i was explaining just earlier this is what i was explaining earlier that u here is uh, the value of theta is zero u cosine of zero is one cosine of zero is one so u times one is u so and also the thing has been served horizontally so the value of u or the velocity is in the x direction so it's definitely u u times time now the time we got the time this time applies because the same time that it it took for this ball to come here to there to have this vertical displacement is the same time that it took to make that horizontal displacement so it is u times the value of t which is 0 0.5148 yeah this times that then plus a half times g times t now this is in the x direction in the horizontal component we do not have gravity the value of gravity is zero in the horizontal component so because the value of gravity is zero it means that this whole term is going to die so it's simply in the x direction it is just that plus zero 
in our previous sessions when i was dealing with uh, displacement in the x direction i would simply set distance is going to be equal to speed times time now i think you're seeing where the speed times time thing is coming from it is coming from the fact that this other portion the gravity in the x direction is zero the gravity is only acting in the y direction that's why here it is considered this time it's considered but in the x direction it is zero that's why we simply remain at the uh, we, we call it distance is equal to speed times time but to be more accurate it is displacement is going to be equal to velocity times time i think you see the difference here in scalar and vector quantities when i said distance is equal to speed times time distance is a scalar quantity speed is a scalar quantity and then when it when we term it in displacement is equal to velocity times time velocity is a vector quantity Veloc uh, displacement is a vector quantity velocity is a vector quantity yeah you get what i mean so that's what that is how we come up to just this this dice so this is going to be when we make you the subject of the formula it's going to become 12 divide that by this and the answer we get So looking at that, we have answered the first question. The first question says, what will be the minimum initial speed? That is the initial speed. The minimum initial speed when the net just clears. If the ball clears the net by at least 0 0.2 meters. So when the ball clears the net by just, you know, 0 0.2 meters, that is the initial speed, which is 23.309. So we've done Roman 1. This is Roman 1 of the question. So now let's get to Roman 2. So Roman 2, where will it land? So by Roman 2, when they ask us where it will land, they're asking us to find this distance here. Because once it clears this by 0 0.2, it is eventually going to land here. So where will it land? We want this distance. That's the displacement in the x direction. That's what we want. By the time here, where will it land? So um, here, by the time it's landing here, Let's see. By the time it lands here, we will have gotten, you know, this is like our origin, right? The point of projection is our origin. So if the point of projection is our origin, what will it be? Its displacement in the x direction will be this. It's what we want. What is its displacement here in the x? Let me call it Sx prime. Then in the y direction, what is its displacement in the y direction? In the y direction, by the time it lands on the ground, remember the ground it is 2.4 meters above. So this y is, this is 2.4 meters. So at the point where it lands, we know that our x, our y displacement is negative 2.4. Actually, this is negative 2.4 negative 2.4 and our x is positive something we need to find the displacement in the x direction and that's how we shall be able to know its displacement at the point where it lands so let's get to it again we are going to use the other equations of motion still from this um when it is this at the point where it lands its displacement in the y direction is going to be ut plus a half g t squared. So again, its displacement in the y direction will be negative 2.4. So this is negative 2.4 is going to be equal to, of course, I already explained that this is zero. The thing was served horizontally. So there's no component in the y direction as far as initial velocity is concerned. So it's going to be zero. This g being a negative will be minus a half times 9.8 times t squared and so making uh this is going to this uh, this is going to become negative 2.4 is going to be negative 9.8 over 2 times t squared and definitely this is going to become making t squared the subject of the formula to multiplying two on both sides is going to give us 4.8 when you find the square root on both sides 
So from that, we are able, from our formula for vertical displacement, we are able to find that by the time it lands on the ground, the time spent will be this, 0 0.6995. So, so now we can go ahead and find the horizontal displacement, which we are being required to find. So displacement in the x direction, Sx, is going to be definitely the same, ut plus a half at squared, and this is going to be equal to the u is uh, what we got earlier, 23.309. Multiply that by the time taken to reach there, which is what we got here, 0 0.6. 995. Remember plus this one is 0 in the x direction. I explained why. So that is going to give us 16. So after getting the value of 16 right there, then we can go ahead and say we've answered this question. Where will it land? So we shall simply come here and say that it will land. A shot is fired from the top of a cliff 200 meters high with a velocity of 500 meters per second at an elevation of 30 degrees. Find the distance from the bottom of the cliff to the point where the shot strikes the ground and the time taken. And then also we need to find the distance from the ground to the highest point created. This is the question we will be answering in this session. Thanks for tuning in. My name is Arnold Rangakuramia and this is Kisembo Academy. I like to summarize my questions with a diagram, so let's get to it. Okay, so right there we have a shot. It's fired from the top of a cliff. So this is the cliff we are talking about. Right there. And the, this is the shot. It is fired from the top of a cliff 200 meters high. So the cliff is 200 meters high with a velocity of 500 meters per second. So it is fired like that with a velocity of 500 meters per second. So meaning our value of u here is... 500 meters per second yeah and uh, at an elevation of 30 degrees so while it's being shot it is shot at an angle of 30 degrees to the horizontal like that so it is shot like that so that in us find the distance from the bottom of the cliff here is the bottom of the cliff they want us to find the distance from the bottom of the cliff to the point where the shot strikes the ground and the time taken so it comes, the shot goes to the ground here. We need to find the distance from the bottom of the cliff right here to, you need to find this distance. That's the first part. Um, to the point where the shot strikes the ground. So the distance from bottom of the cliff to the point where the shot strikes the ground and the time taken. Also, we need to find the time taken for the thing to move from here up to there that's uh, the first task then they want us to find the distance from the ground to the highest point reached that is uh, Roman 2 this is the highest point reached they want us to find this distance as well let me call it H it's also needed so those are the things that we need to calculate in this question. So let's get started with Roman 1. We want to find the distance, uh, you know, this, this this is now like horizontal displacement. Now, one thing that, uh, again, I'll keep emphasizing is that now here we are going to solve this using equations of motion, more like from first principles. We will not be able to apply, you know, the derived formulas in their entirety. So, Let's get started. We need to find this distance here. And as far as this is concerned, this distance here is the horizontal displacement X. So this is the horizontal displacement S in the horizontal direction. By the time this comes and drops here, 
this is the point of projection and if this is the point of projection it means that this is our zero level and if that is our zero level okay so by the time this point comes goes up it gets negatively displaced when it's here our displacement between here and there is what they want the displacement in the x direction and then from here to here in the y direction what is our displacement here our displacement in the y direction here is because it is falling below the the zero ground the below the point of projection it is 200 meters so this is negative 200 meters okay so in the negative sense by the time it hits the ground it will have gone back down by 200 meters we need to find the distance or the displacement in the x direction by the time it is here so we are going to use the second equation of motion to find this value of x so we shall begin from the known to the, go to the unknown so we know that the displacement in the x direction is that so we shall come and say s in the y direction you know that is going to be ut you know plus a half g t squared so displacement in the y direction is negative 200 meters is given by initial velocity u now the initial velocity here u is 500 meters but it is at an angle of 30 degrees and since our displacement we are working it out displacement in the y direction it means that even our initial velocity should be resolved in the y direction so it means it's this in this case u is going to become this it will be u times the sine of 30 we are resolving it in the y direction times the time taken yeah then this is going to become plus a half the gravity is negative because it's moving against gravity it's minus g times t squared so we shall go ahead and fill in the figures minus 200 meters is going to be u is 500 so it's 500 times sine of 30 then this is minus uh, 9.81 over 2 so this is going to end up being negative 200 is going to give us minus 4.9 t squared if we are to rearrange this quadratic equation this t bring it that way this one also take it that way we shall end up with 4.9 t squared minus 250 t minus 200 is equal to zero so when we solve that quadratic equation either using the the what we call the bulldozer method or call it the quadratic formula we shall end up with two values of t the first value of t will be 51.7 And the value the other value of t will be negative 0 0.79 of course we do not have negative time so we shall go on with the first value of t so that the value the time taken so from our vertical displacement using this formula our vertical displacement we're able to find the time taken for this to move from here to come to that point actually we have solved this part the time by just doing that so we know that the time taken is 51.76 seconds so now that we know the time we can go ahead and find sx the horizontal displacement so we shall go on and say here that our horizontal displacement sx is still given by ut um, plus a half g t squared our sx displacement in the x direction which we are looking for the distance from you know the bottom of the cliff to where the stone lands which is this one right yeah is given by um, 
the initial velocity u is supposed to be resolved to the x direction because now we are looking at displacement in the x direction so this value of u needs to be resolved in the x direction and in this case it's going to become u cos cosine of x multiply that by t then that's going to become um, plus now in the x direction remember I said in the x direction we do not have gravity in the x direction gravity happens in the y direction in the x direction there's no gravity so this is zero and so it means this whole term is zero so we only remain with this plus zero so this is going to become s of x is going to become u which is 500 times cosine of x okay cosine of theta cosine of the this x it's okay it's supposed to have been cosine of 30 here cosine of 30 times the time uh, the time take, taken for this to come here up to there to cover that sx is 51.76 that's times 51.76 and what do we have so looking at that we have been able to answer the question here the question required us to find the distance from the bottom of the cliff to the point where the shot strikes the ground. The distance is this. It so happens to be the displacement in the x direction. And uh, they said they, they should, and the time taken, we're able to find the time taken, which is 51.76 seconds right there. So you realize that here we're just playing with this equation of motion. We are playing around with it in the x direction and in the y direction. And we're able to end up with whatever we're ending up so Roman 2 they're asking us to find the distance from the ground to the highest point reached so the distance from the ground to the highest point reached they want us to find this distance now part of this distance we already know this distance part of it we know the distance is 200 meters so if we know this distance as 200 meters we only need to find that other distance up and that's it so to find this remaining distance up, we shall go ahead and find it. Now, we already know this one here. It's 200 meters. So this remaining distance, since it is a perfect trajectory the way you see it here, we can use one of our equations, our derived equations for maximum height. Maximum height reached if this thing is to move from here up to there. So maximum height, capital H, is going to be given by u squared sine squared theta, divide that by 2g. Our u squared, our value of u is 500, so it's going to be 500 meters per second squared, multiply that by sine squared of theta, in this case theta is 30. 30, divide that by 2, multiply that by 9.81. So what we have here is 31. So we have this as our uh, as our figure here. That, that's the height we get. So in other words, this height here from here up to there is this. It is 31, 318. It's 3185.525. Now that we know this portion, this height, by using this, then we can go ahead and answer the question. The question wants us to find the distance from the ground to the highest point reached. This is our ground, so that's the highest point reached. So from the ground, it's going to be 200 plus this that we just found here, and then we get our answer. So it means um, our answer will be the highest, this value of H is going to be the 200 meters we add that extra distance we found which is and our answer will be and that's our answer right there in so doing we have finished answering roman 2 of the question and that brings us to the end of this session thanks thanks for watching please remember to share this lecture with your friends my name is anuranga kuramia I'll catch you in our upcoming session. 
Take care. In this session, we are simply going to answer this question. A ball rolls off the edge of a table, which is one meter above the floor, with a horizontal velocity of one meter per second. Find the time taken to hit the floor and the velocity with which it hits the floor. Let's summarize this using a diagram. So we have a ball. It rolls off the edge of a table. This is our table right there. Okay. This is our table. A ball rolls off the edge of a table, which is one meter above the floor. So this table is one meter above the floor, right like that. So which is one meter above the horizontal floor, or one meter above the floor, which is horizontal. The velocity, with the velocity of one meter per second. So this ball is going to roll off the table. It's rolling off with the horizontal velocity of, you know, one meter per second. So find the time taken to hit the floor. So when it comes, it comes and hits this floor right there. So what's the time taken to hit the floor? So from that information, we already we only know that by the time it comes here and it hits the floor, by the time it hits the floor, it has been displaced in the x direction by one meter in the negative direction. Remember, this is the point of projection. So meaning that this is our zero ground, our zero level. So by the time it is here, it has been displaced by, you know, the the displacement in the in the y direction is negative one. So since that's the information we have, and they want us to find the time, and in the formula for displacement, there is that value of t, we can go ahead and find. So using displacement in the y direction is going to be equal to ut minus a half g t squared. This minus is coming from the fact that the gravity is negative, yeah? That's why this turns to negative. So the, this is negative one, the horizontal, the vertical displacement, that is displacement in the y direction is negative one is going to be equal to u. Now, um, this is in the x direction. They say the ball rolls off the edge of a table, which is one meter above the floor with a horizontal velocity. If it is a horizontal velocity, it means there is no component of this u in the vertical direction. So meaning that there is zero. The component of velocity in the y direction is zero. So this whole time is going to die. So it's going to become zero minus a half times gravity, which is 9.81. Multiply that by t squared times t squared. And uh, yeah, they want us to find the time taken to hit the floor. And so that's how we're going to find that value of t. So this is negative one. It's going to give us negative 9.81. Divide that by two. Multiply that by t squared. When we make t the subject of the formula here, of course, this is going to become this and that will cancel to multiply two on both sides. You remain with two over 9.81. Find this is squared, yeah? Square it on both sides. So when we square it this on both sides, we end up with our value of t as 0.4515 seconds. So that's the answer. So that's the time it takes for this ball to roll to come and hit the ground. So Roman 2, they're telling us to find the velocity with which it hits the floor. The velocity with which it hits the floor. Now the way we find that is maybe just to illustrate something here. When we are having motion in a projectile, and the motion moves like that, right? Okay, so as it's moving like that, it starts from here with an initial velocity. Let's call that initial velocity u. So as it keeps moving, that velocity changes to v right there this is a velocity v up to there it changes direction that is velocity v like that until it reaches at maybe at the, the, the same ground which is still velocity v that is initial velocity u then the initial velocity final velocity v final velocity v depending on the point where you are 
But just one thing that you need to know that whenever it is as it's changing direction, when this final velocity V has at this point, it has um, you know a component in the y direction and the component in the x direction. At this point, this velocity has a component in the y and a component in the x. At this point, this velocity has a component in the x and down here a component in the y. Same with this. By the time it reaches here, it has a component in the x and a component in the y. That is how it is. And so in order for us to find these values of v, the final velocities, we simply have to resolve the x and y components like we are going to see right there. So if they say that find the velocity with which it hits the flow, we are looking at this here that at this point, by the time it comes here and it hits the flow, its velocity is probably in that direction right there, right? The final velocity. So while it is there, it is having a component both in the x and in the y. Let me try and redraw this. The ball rolled off from a table. Just redrawing it from a table and it hits, this is the flow. So the ball comes and it hits right there. So while it came, it started with initial velocity. Then we have another velocity there, final velocity then here maybe it came like that that's a v at the, or the, by the time it reached it hit here it hit the ground with a certain velocity v but this velocity v with which it hit the ground has components in the x so there are components of that velocity in the x direction and it, there's a component of that same velocity in the y direction how do we find these components of the x and the y direction? We, are, we use the first equation of motion, v is equal to u plus a t. So we're going to find the component of the x, of this velocity in the x direction. Then we're going to find the component of that velocity in the y direction. Then from there, we shall go ahead and find the velocity with which it hits the ground, which so happens to be v. So let's get started. Let's find the component of the velocity in the x direction. So we shall do this by saying that the component of that velocity in the x direction is given by u plus acceleration times time. The component of that velocity in the x direction is going to be equal to u. Now the initial velocity, remember here, they're telling us that it is a horizontal velocity. So meaning that this in the x direction, this u is the horizontal velocity here, it is one meter per second, right? So it's going to be u. It's going to be 1, since so it's in the horizontal direction, then plus acceleration times time. Now remember, acceleration in the horizontal component is 0. So meaning that if the acceleration to gravity here is 0, it means that this whole terminology is 0. So the velocity in the x direction is 1, since it's a horizontal, you know, velocity. That is vx is 1. Let's look at vy. This is vx. Let's look at Vy. So finding the component of the velocity in the y direction is going to be equal to, you know, u plus a t steel. What is u? Now, the initial velocity here, the ball, in the y direction is zero. Why? Because this ball has been, is, having, is having a horizontal velocity. It is not inclined to theta or to any angle, so in the y direction, there is no component of that velocity in the y direction. This is zero. Then that is plus. Now gravity, of course, here we're dealing in the y direction, so there's gravity, which is negative 9.81 times the time. Now the time taken for this thing to move, to come and hit here, that value of t is the time we found in Roman 1, which is 0 0.4515. And of course, this is going to be equal to Vy, which we are looking for. Now, remember, even this Vy, according to this diagram, this velocity, Vy, is pointing in downwards, in the negative direction. So this is actually negative Vy. So you'll find that negative Vy is going to give us this. This negative will cancel out with that negative. We remain with Vy. 
the velocity in the y direction is going to be equal to so we found vx and vy like that so now that we have gotten the component of the velocity the final velocity at that point in the x direction and we have also been able to get the component of the final velocity in the y direction let me redraw this just to show you how it turns out so to read to redraw that this thing has been this we have that we have that this is vx in the x direction we got one right there so this is one one meters per second in the y direction we got vy is equal to 4.431 and so we want to find the final velocity, which so happens to be this. We want this. The question wants us to find find the velocity with which the, the ball hits the floor. That's the final velocity we are looking for. So we can redraw this using a triangle. Like the way we are resolving forces, the triangle of forces. So we have Vx like that. It's in that direction like that. That is the Vx then we have the vy so we draw the vy at the end of vx vy like that then we have our so from the vy is right there okay which is 4.431 so it means that um the resultant velocity is this from big where it begins from to where it ends in that direction so we want this V and also we're supposed to find the angle theta upon which this V is acting. Now it doesn't matter whether you start with VX then VY or you start with VY both and end with VX. It will still, the, 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 the direction of this will be the same. Let's try it here. In case I started drawing my triangle using VY instead. I'll come here and say vy like that okay that's my vy then at the end of my vy I draw my vx it's in that direction yeah vx in that direction and then still if this is my vx again you'll notice that the main thing that we're trying to look for which is this the final velocity you'll find that they are still the same they are parallel the same direction so it doesn't matter how you draw the triangle as long as you're accurate about it so again so so we shall get started with uh you know after drawing our triangle of force of, of the vector our vector triangle so let's go ahead and find our value of v we are going to use pythagoras theorem so we know to find our value of v v is given by vx squared plus vy squared what's our vx that is one squared plus our vy our vy is 4.431 squared that's going to give us our v and all this is under the square root so from here our value of v shall be equal to So now that we have found the velocity with which, uh, the final velocity with which, you know, the V, this is the final velocity with which this ball hits that ground. So we can go ahead and find that value of theta. You know, the answer is not complete until we find that value of theta. Velocity is a vector quantity. So we need to find both the magnitude and the direction. So let's find the direction. So for the direction, again, we are going to use trigonometry to find that value of theta here. So what we shall do right there, we shall go ahead and say, we shall use the tan. Tan of theta is going to be equal to the opposite, which is Vy. Divide that by the adjacent, which is Vx. What is Vy? We got our Vy as 4.431. Divide that by Vx, which is 1. So our theta here is tan inverse 4.431.
and we shall end up with 77.29 degrees. So we conclude our answer by saying So that's how we conclude our answer and from there we've been able to answer both questions Roman 1 and Roman 2 this brings us to the end of this session thanks for watching my name is Arnold Ranga Kramia remember to share this video with your friends I'll catch you in the next session take care A particle is projected at a speed or with a speed of 30 meters per second at an angle of 30 degrees to the horizontal. Let's summarize this question with a diagram. This is the question we are going to solve in this session and let's get started. My name is Anuranga Kuramia. This is Kisembu Academy. So we have a particle here, right there. It's here. As you can see, it is projected with a speed of 30 meters per second. So I project this particle upward at a speed, a value of u there, at a speed of 30 meters per second, okay, at an angle of 30 degrees, this is 30 degrees, to the horizontal. So find the speed of the particle at a height 4 meters above the point of projection. This is the point of projection. So if the thing has been projected upward, it reaches a point whereby this distance is 4 meters and they want us to find what is the speed what is the speed at that point of projection you know find the speed of the particle at a height four meters above the point of projection so if that's the speed they want of course this thing continues like that but they want us to find the speed at that point and so like we have been doing in our previous session once it reaches at that speed this is the final velocity. It has a component in. There is a velocity in the x direction. We have a velocity. I mean, this is the velocity in the y direction. We have a component of that velocity in the x direction. So we will find those two and we're able to get the value of v at that point when it is 4. Again, here we shall play around with the equations of motion and the most favorable one to deal with here because since they've the they, they final we want to find the value of v when it is at four meters so if we are to say v is equal to u plus acceleration times time there is no tagging there is no there is no information about the four meters in this so if we use for v squared is equal to u squared plus two a s S is displacement. So the displacement here can help us make sure that, you know, we are getting the V at w when the displacement is 4 meters. Now, mark you this 4 meters, this is displacement in the Y direction. Yeah. So from the information that has been given to us in the question, we know that when the thing is 4 meters above the point of projection, you know, 4 meters, this is actually displacement in the y direction four meters above the point of projection and we need to find the velocity the final velocity at that point so we shall begin with you know finding the vertical component of that velocity which is vy so finding vy is going to be equal to you know of course it's u squared plus 2as let me first quote it the way it is then i start substituting velocity in the y direction which we are looking for is u squared now initial velocity squared remember it is 30 degrees but it is being uh, projected at an angle we need to make sure that this u is resolved in the y direction so it's going to be equal to u sine of 30 all this is squared plus 2 times acceleration due to gravity is negative 9.81 times the distance that is the uh, distance s is the displacement in the y direction in this case it's four meters at that point times four 
so this continues we get vy is going to be ur value of u is 30 so it's going to be got 30 times sine of 30 all this is squared uh, this negative affects this and becomes minus 2 times 9.81 multiply that by 4 and so we shall end up this is by the way v squared v squared v squared so our value of v in the y direction is going to be equal to so this is v in the y direction in other words at this point it is the velocity in the y direction let's get the velocity in the x direction so to find the velocity in the x direction we are going to go ahead and say v in the x direction squared is giving us u squared plus 2 times a times s so moving on it's going to become now the initial velocity in the x direction is we resolve it here we resolve it in the y direction so here we are resolving the initial velocity in the x direction and this is going to become u times the cosine of you know cosine of 30 because 30 is the figure squared now that is plus 2 times acceleration times you know the displacement in the x direction but you realize that as far as the x direction since we are finding the velocity in the x direction acceleration in the x direction is zero so it means the value of acceleration here is zero if it is zero it means that this whole term is going to become zero like that this is zero so we only have this squared is going to be equal to v x squared so we end up with vx squared v x is going to give us the square root of u cosine of 30 that is meaning it's 30 cosine of 30 this whole thing by the way is squared so we end up with our answer as our velocity in the x direction Now that we have our velocity in the y direction and our velocity in the x direction, we can go ahead and find the velocity at the point when it is 4 meters above the point of projection. That's what the question requires us to find. So to draw that v, we shall come and say, um, to draw the, the, vector, the vector diagram here, we shall say this is v in our x direction. Then in the y, we draw it up there, v in the y right like that what we are interested in in finding that v so v in the x direction here is 25.9808 then v in the y is 12.1045 so we need to find this velocity and the angle but we don't need to find the angle why because the question says here that find the speed of the particle speed is a scalar quantity so with a scalar quantity we don't need to find this value of theta the direction so we're only going to find this v however if they had told us that find the velocity of the particle at the height four meters above the point of projection velocity would be a vector quantity so we need to find this value of v and the angle at which it is inclined to the horizontal and then we conclude in our answer by saying that the velocity is this and it is inclined at this angle to the horizontal however here they are saying us they are just telling us to find the speed of the particle at a height four meters so we are only simply going to find the magnitude of this magnitude we don't need to find that value of theta so let's go ahead and find this of course we shall find that using Pythagoras theorem we shall say v squared is going to be equal to this plus that squared so it's 25.9808 squared plus 12.1045 squared and then of course when we put that in our calculator our value of v will become so that's our speed we've answered that question find the speed of the particle at a height four meters above the point of projection and this is the speed this brings us to the end of this session thanks for watching my name is arnold rangakuramia i encourage you to share this video with your friends be sure to hit that subscribe button if you've not yet subscribed to this youtube channel 
For any clarifications, feel free to comment in the comment section below and you can also send me an email. All those details can be found in the about section of this YouTube channel.